Hey everybody, welcome back. It's uh, Jotson here on the Godot Official Channel. <laughs> and I feel like I'm going to embarrass myself today more than normal. More than the usual amount, which is not insignificant. Welcome in everybody. Yeah, Godot Engine official back from uh, Gamescom. Hey, Cubus. Evolt. Lencius. Hey, buddy. Morcinta. Hey, Django Feet. Psionics. Darkwood Dragon. Good morning. I was just up watching the uh, sunrise. Uh, it's not quite up yet, but the horizon was glowing. It was very pretty. Shiny's Jinkin, hello. Solar Labyrinth, hello. Good morning. Thorax Kitsu, afternoon, everybody. We have a European here. Good afternoon. Uh, who else we got? Emor, Fish Heads, welcome, welcome. Memes at 3 a.m. Lencius, go to sleep, man. <clears throat> Get yourself a Godot plush. I need to get a Godot plush. Condi, Panda Coder, Aramis, hey, how's it going? J King. Embarrassment is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> back at 50 feet. Hey, back at 50 feet. Do you know 12 feet up? You guys should get together. Thorax, how's it going? I'm it's great. I've been awake. I'm I am awake. I'm fully awake. Officially, I'm a fully awake person. The Spriter's Resource. Good morning. The Spriter's Resource sounds interesting. You should tell us about that a little bit. Logic Geek, K. Hey. Space Diver. Thanks for streaming. Well, hold your hold your thanks until I'm done. You may you may <laughs> you may change your mind in a little bit. Spoo streams can relate to the sunrise. It's three p.m. and I'm not quite up yet either. <laughs> now you missed the sunrise, but sunset maybe that'll be nice. And guest four nine zero 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 one two three zero six five four. Hey, dude. Well, welcome in everybody. Um, I have no idea um, how many of you there are. I'm sure there are lots. Uh, I don't know why, but I'm a little bit nervous. I'll just say that. Um, so I'm probably going to be a little weird for a few minutes. Um. But let me just start by saying, I, it's great to be part of the community here. Uh, Godot Engine has been very, very good to me. And uh, I, I've i met nothing but um, wonderful people through using Godot. And uh, been using it for a long time. And the experience has been positive the whole time. And just I'm glad to be here honored to be here actually doing this now uh to uh to hang out with you guys and for you to hang out with me and I don't know it's just it's really cool I'm happy I'm happy this is happening new Godot user and loving it welcome to Godot Do you know the best way to start learning GD script? Excited to be here. What are we working on today? What do I like more, developing games or blogging for game devs? <laughs> okay, questions are coming fast and furious already. So let me just say what we're going to be doing. Uh, here's the plan. <clears throat> and the plan can change. I don't know how well this plan is going to go. I kind of came up with this plan yesterday. Don't tell. Don't tell Nat, but I'm kind of winging. Um, but today's, today's lecture, 
Can you imagine if I just came on here and just lectured for two hours? That's not going to happen. Um, today's uh, Godot talk is going to be about a little bit, as much as I can, about the creative process, um, the Valley of Poop, uh, post-launch blues, maybe we'll talk about a little bit. Mostly, though, the creative process, searching for a new game to make, prototyping, that sort of stuff. And I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, we might get through it pretty fast. We might it might take longer. But if you guys have any questions at all about anything, please just interrupt me and ask whatever you want. And we'll talk about that instead. Um, a little bit about me, if you guys don't know, is um, I'm, I'm nobody. I just started using Godot, I don't know, a long time ago. Like, I think with version one maybe version two. I can't remember. It was so long ago and been using every version ever since. Uh, I've been a fairly serious hobby game developer since like 2013 or so. And then published, um, a couple of commercial games, uh, been working on commercial games since like 2019, uh, published gravity Ace myself, solo like an idiot and then i worked on the dome keeper team uh for a bit two years in fact uh and helped uh bring a dome keeper out into the world and those are both great experiences i loved it it was a lot of fun and here i am doing it again Let's just tackle some of these questions. So Sminty asks, what's the best way to start learning JavaScript or GD script? I said JavaScript. <laughs> oh, please forgive me, Lordy. The best way to start learning GD script is probably to go to the official Godot documentation and click on getting started and start following those tutorials. That is honestly, if you're new to Godot and you're new to programming, um, start there. Really, I, I I think a lot of people don't know about the Getting Started Guide and how good it is. But really, go to the Getting Started Guide in Godot, uh, Godot's docs, and just start there. <clears throat> no homework. There will be no homework. There will be a test. No, there's not going to be a test. No homework, no test. It's going to be easy A. Started with the second 2D tutorial and then YouTube and ChatGPT. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. And if you get stuck, look around. There's like tons of people who can help you out. So where to begin? I'm not quite working full time on my game now. Unfortunately, as you may or may not know, indie game development, it's hard to pay the bills with indie game development alone, especially when you live where I live. Uh, I live in Southern California and it is expensive AF out here. Uh, so I have, um, like everything I do is a sidekick. <laughs> I'm self-employed. Uh, I could theoretically work on my game full time, but I have to also eat occasionally. And so, <laughs> so I have to do other work um, to, you know, accomplish my goals of not dying of starvation. It's very inconvenient. It's very, very inconvenient, I'll tell you that. Eating is very important indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, let's get started. Let's talk about, um, I don't know, this sounds so pretentious, the creative process, but maybe, maybe if I just start talking about, like, 
the games that I've made and we can kind of go from there. Hey, Jacob. JD. Hey, JD. JD's going to be uh, streaming Friday, I think, on this channel. So hold on to your hats. I'm going first. Uh, this is a strategy. This is a serious strategy by the Godot people to make me go first. That way, everybody else looks really good. So <laughs> the rest of the week is going to be awesome. Creative process. So, I, like I said, I've been working on commercial games since like 2019, and uh, the uh, that was Gravity Ace, and I'm really proud of that project. It didn't, well, it, it did fine commercially. It's you know I still get a check from Steamer once in a while, but uh, I remember like I was working on that one for probably too long. That game. And towards the end, uh, I was looking around for, well, what am I going to do after this game is over? So I started looking around at new prototypes. Like, what am I going to work on next? And so even before Gravity Ace was published, I'd started working on some prototypes. And I want to show you some of them. And let's start with a weird one. And these were... I don't know. I don't even, I hesitate to even kind of call them prototypes because they're, they're sort of like just experiments, really. I had like an idea in my head about what I wanted to make. And it was probably also influenced by what I had been watching lately or other games that I'd seen recently. And I was trying to think, well, I was trying to just explore some ideas basically and most of them went nowhere or at least at the time I thought they kind of went nowhere um, but then it was interesting like looking back at all these prototypes I saw a lot of things that ended up in later games even though I didn't like consciously do it so this was a prototype about like a a platformer guy some kind of some kind of like creature that you control that could walk through caves and stuff with like a just a bunch of legs on it and it was creepy and this there was actually <laughs> actually i'm just remembering now there was a there was a prototype that we did in dome keeper which had um one of the um spacemen had like a dr octopus like backpack on and he moved around like this where he had like these arms that would go out and touch the cavern walls. So I did end up kind of using this later, although I don't think we ever published that update. I don't think we didn't really finish it. It wasn't really going anywhere then. And we didn't really have the time to make all the upgrades for that guy and like how he would mine things and all that kind of stuff. But it was fun to work on uh, just as an experiment. So this is like from 2021. I published Gravity Ace in 22. And like I said, I was just kind of thinking about like, what am I going to work on next after Gravity Ace is done? Which honestly, now that I think back on that too, was kind of silly. I, 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 I probably should have been more focused on what I was doing instead of thinking about the next thing already. But I have a, I mean, tell me if this is you you kind of get tired of what you're working on. You want to work on something new. So that was the legs prototype. And then I wanted to get into like 3D a little bit. So these are all like old, like this is also 21. Uh, that's why we're looking at Godot 3.5. And I don't know, I think, I think I might have made this for a friend, actually, who was doing something similar. They were doing a similar type of game, and they were having tr a little trouble with the um, movement and getting the character to stick to the ground. So I thought I would try it out and see if I could help them out in any way. 
and I ended up making this and it was kind of fun. Uh, like it's actually just kind of fun to move around like this. And I thought this might make a fun, like skiing game or like a skateboarding game or something. Um, I don't know. It's kind of neat, kind of neat to play with the, um, character. This is a long time ago. I didn't really know how to model anything. So this guy is literally just made in the engine. <laughs> He's made from a, um, whatever this is, um, like a pill shape. And then he's made from two spheres for the eyes and then two more smaller spheres for the pupils. That's it. Just built him in engine. And then called that a player character and then ran with it just for the prototype. Um, I bring that up because I was talking to a guy just the other day who was like, I don't have any art skills. I don't know how to make anything. And I'm like, I don't have any art skills either. I just fake it till, you know, look at, look at this guy. Look at this guy vibrating. I mean, you don't need a ton, you know? And, uh, I've seen tons of games where there's really not much art skill involved but they're still good games. So don't let that stop you from making a game. Letting Jotson go first to work out the problems. <laughs> C sharp or GD script and fight. I mean, I don't think it matters. Let me let me just be controversial there and say it doesn't matter. Use whatever you feel like. Hey Sonny Sensei. Hey practical. Wow. Everybody's here. So cool. Considering most of us use GD script, Godot for its iteration speed, I imagine GD script is popular here. I mean, GD script is popular. I'm sure of that. There's tutorials everywhere written in GD script. Um, I do think the the that GD script does have a leg up on C sharp in terms of iteration speed. C sharp is fine as well. And if all you know is C sharp and you're very comfortable with C sharp and you can program well in C sharp, you should totally use C sharp. I have a journey full of my next ideas. Yeah. It's so cliche, right? To have all these prototypes just hanging around, but I'm glad I kept them because like I said, as I was going through them, I kind of noticed a pattern and it's, it kind of guided how we ended up, how I ended up where I am now. If you made it a sphere, it would make a planet with gravity. Yeah, yeah, totally. Hey, Valiant Cheese. I will literally stay up 24 hours straight with a new idea, making a game doc for it, planning out code architecture, art mockups. Then I go to work for the week, and the next week, and I've already thought of a new idea, and thus the cycle repeats. <laughs> also, a ton of free resources. Yeah, totally. Do we get a song? I mean, maybe, maybe we'll see if there's enough popular demand for a song. Maybe I'll, I'll do a song. So then, then I kind of switched gears and I said, you know what? I've never made a platformer before. Why don't I just try making a platformer and see what all the fuss is about? And I came up with this guy. It's a chicken with a knife. And, um, I basically just prototyped all the different platforming movement so I've got you know the run I've got the jump I've got the double jump I've got the triple jump because he's a chicken uh, you got the wall slide got the jumping off the wall you got the this maneuver and I thought you know what after I was done making all this, I'm like, it's kind of fun to move around like this. I actually like playing some games like this. But I really decided then 
that I wasn't interested in making one. So I stopped. Yeah, it's a chicken with a knife. <laughs> Your abuela's neighborhood. His name was Edgar. Thanks. I mean, if anybody wants to make chicken knife, go for it. The name is unencumbered by uh, trademark or copyrights. Knock yourself out. This makes me feel like uh, I want to do 2D again, though. Just playing this right now. I'm like, ugh, oh, there's something so nice about doing 2D. Part of the... Part of the journey that I've been on has been like discovering what type of game I like to make and how I like to make them. And I don't know, there's a part of me that's like addicted to like complexity. And there's another part of me that really, really, really wants to just make the simplest things possible. And that guy usually loses. That guy usually loses. I don't know what to say. We're mean to that guy. Yeah, Chicken with a Gun would be the sequel. I mean, it's not necessarily the simplification of mechanics in 2D versus 3D. It's more like... Like, what's the simplest thing you can make? What's the simplest expression of an idea without any of the clutter, you know? Not not necessarily minimalist, but just... Um, I don't know, you can have a, an idea, right? But then you take out all the stuff that isn't necessary for the idea. And you're left with something... more pure... I don't know how how to put it exactly. And it could be 2D, it could be 3D. But 2D, I think, kind of lends itself to simplicity a little bit better than 3D does. It, I mean, it definitely does in terms of implementation complexity. I was struggling with this yesterday. Um, 3D, there's all kinds of complexity. It has nothing to do with math. It's just viewing angles and lighting complexity is just a nightmare. And this was probably the most fleshed out of the prototypes that I did in 21. Like I said, at the time I was pretty busy uh, trying to get Gravity Ace out the door. And I was searching around for what the next game might potentially be. That's unfortunate. This guy right on the um, runway. But I made this thing. I was playing this this morning. There's not much of a game here. There's like a nugget of an idea. But I was playing this this morning. I was like, this is still pretty fun. I abandoned this prototype because of gameplay issues that I hadn't resolved. And, I mean, this is part of the creative process, too. We should talk about that a little bit. But, like, part of the creative process is, like, imagine we're sketching, we're drawing something, right? You start out with some scribbles, you sketch a little bit. Uh, like, nobody I know goes right to a finished painting from the first pen stroke, right? Or a paintbrush, or whatever it is the first uh, pat of clay. Nobody goes right to the finished project. You go you go through a series of steps of sketching and drawing it over and over again and changing the lines and erasing a lot. And along the way, you kind of have an idea of where you're going sometimes. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just start drawing with nothing in your head at all. And sometimes you have an idea of what you want the outcome to be. And it never turns out exactly like that. 
and you may along the way find like different a different path and at the time when i was making this and and finding the right path sometimes takes time it just takes time this is all prototype yeah placeholder stuff graphics sound everything so I, I I don't know I I don't can't remember how long I spent on this maybe a week, and it was fun. I did enjoy playing it. Um, I think I did design like the whole document for how the game would work, but I didn't anticipate some problems with 3D. So in this particular game. One of the problems, the the big problem actually, is um, dodging bullets from these bad guys. So when they start shooting, the problem here is you don't know which of these bullets is going to hit you. It's impossible to tell what's going to hit you and what's going to miss. Like I'm dodging things that I don't need to dodge, like that one, right? It's like under me or something, but it's hard to tell. And these guys are all aiming where I used to be. And there's situations where I just can't dodge them. And I'm, so I'm doing this a lot. I'm just changing altitude a lot. And it didn't feel great. So I was like, okay, I don't know how to solve that problem. I tried switching to a different type of enemy. So there's this other enemy that shoots straight up and their bullets change color. And now these red bullets are always going to hit you when they're, when you're high, they never hit you down here though. So you can just dodge them by just being down here. But this view of the game is just not as, I mean, it's fun to do once in a while, but you wouldn't want to play the whole game from this angle. You see these bullets floating around like that. It's kind of weird. So this has a different set of problems. Um, there are potentially lots of different ways to solve this problem. And, but at the time, this, remember this was like three years ago. At the time I had no idea. And so I had to just abandon it. Um, and move on to something else. And it was around this time too, I was a little tired. And so I took some time off just to take a break from things. I think this was like towards the end of the year maybe. And I usually take off like... Christmas time and just disappear for a while. Uh, like every year. I've done that for like, I don't know, the past 20 years. Like November, December, January. I kind of just disappear for a while. We'll see what happens this year. But so, I mean, just look at this. It's too messy. There's too much stuff on the screen. This isn't the pure idea that I was talking about a minute ago. But I think there is some way to do it. And so back in 21, I didn't know how to solve it. But I, but playing it this morning again, I feel like I might know how to solve it, actually. And that just came with um, experience, you know? Like, I've made a lot of things since I made this prototype. And sometimes you just need to, to wait and get some more experience doing other things. And then finally it kind of clicks and comes back together again. I do love like, let me turn off these, these bullets. I do love doing the bombing runs like this and then seeing the bomb hit going into slow mode, like dropping a bomb right here, slow mo. And then seeing it all explode. It's so cool. I mean, I enjoy doing that. And I like flying through the clouds. I think there's something about this idea. But it may not necessarily be um, a combat game. It may be something else entirely. But, but still have this kind of feel of flying around and dropping um, things onto targets. But it could be delivering packages or something else instead. I think I think I might have a way to solve this problem now, but it just took some time. I'm just kind of a slow guy, you know, it comes to this type of thing. I'm not the type of guy that can just think of um, 
things and go real fast. It takes me a while to like figure out what I want things to be. Yeah, Jacob, right. You, you would need the camera directly over the plane to be able to dodge the bullets like dot bullet hell style, which is which is totally accurate. That's why <laughs> that's one big reason why a lot of the bullet hells are 2D. They're either 2D or they have a perspective that's 2D or they put everything on the same plane if it's 3D. So that this problem just I mean it's making it effectively 2D that makes the problem go away. Yeah, so you guys are already like saying a lot of the uh, solutions, right? Uh, not a mouse, Valiant, Jacob, Spoo Streams, Mars, right? You guys are already thinking some of the solutions. Um, but a lot of the ones you're mentioning have other problems. Anyway, it's complicated. It was complicated for me. So I ended up abandoning that idea too. That was in 2021. And then in 22, I made the final push and pushed uh, Gravity Ace out. That came out in like May. Um, and then I joined the Dome Keeper team like late in 21 and worked on it through maybe, maybe January 22. I worked on that for two years. Um, but while I was working on that, I still continued working on other prototypes. So after I launched Gravity Ace in May of 22, I lost my mind and started making more prototypes right away. This was a mistake. <laughs> this was a mistake. You shouldn't do this. You should take a break. Um, because what happened it was... After I launched the game, it was something I'd been working on for so long that after it launched, I felt a little lost. Didn't know what to do anymore. It felt, and this happens pretty frequently actually. Whenever I do a big project, something big and creative that I spend a lot of time and energy on, after it's done, I feel depressed for about a month or two. Sometimes it's longer. I just get, I just feel down, like nothing, nothing works anymore, you know? And, um, I, yeah, it's normal, right? So if you're a new game developer and you've never experienced this, just know it's probably coming for you and it's normal. It's fine. But during that time, probably best not to do things <laughs> and expect them to be good. Um, but I did it anyway. And this was one of them. Uh, I, I, I don't know if this is still there's an idea here. I think there is an idea here because I think I've seen a couple other games that basically do this idea. Um, I was starting with a intersection simulator and I thought, wouldn't it be fun? Here's my thinking. I thought, wouldn't it be fun to make an intersection simulator? And then I made it and then I go and then I said, you know what? This is no fun at all. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> so it, just making an intersection simulator is not enough. I needed more of an idea than that. And there are people who have made intersection simulators, which are puzzle games. Those are kind of fun. Um, I've played a couple of different traffic simulation games, which are, which are kind of fun. Uh, you could argue that city skylines is really just a, a vehicle traffic simulator. And that game is a lot of fun. Um, but that's not what I was going for. I wanted something, I don't know. I don't know what I was going for, honestly. That's probably why I stopped this. Because I made this and I thought, eh, that's interesting. I can see how I could make like different pieces and different types of cars and you can control the stoplights maybe. Maybe you could simulate a little section of a city. Um, but I didn't have anything new to bring to this idea. Uh, nothing terribly interesting to bring to it. So moved on pretty quickly. That was the traffic thing. Uh, 
then I did a prototype about cars. And this is me like jumping back into 3D again. I think at the time I was thinking, I really need to get into 3D. Because um, I'd only been done 2D for like 10 years. And just kind of shied away from 3D. But I thought, why not, you know? Let's learn 3D, and maybe that'll like open up our horizons a little bit. There's like more stuff we could make. And this, I remember talking with a friend about it. I was like, dude, <laughs> open world, Mad Max, you know, convoy of trucks, combat, jumping from vehicle to vehicle. He's like, yes, let's make it. And <laughs> I got this far and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> it, sounds, it seems kind of complicated. <laughs> and then now that I think back on that idea, I'm like, yeah, that was, that was a little complicated. Um, the vehicle movement is not the hard part of that game. The hard part of that game is the whole <laughs> open world and designing everything that goes into it and all the quests that you have to do. And it's like, yeah, that if, if the two of us had like, 20 years maybe we could make it but I don't know about you I, I don't have 20 years to spend on one game uh, I may not have 20 years of life left <laughs> so so I gotta pick the things I do you know more carefully so this was fun um, here's another example of uh, programmer art where I just modeled the car as a box um, but from certain angles and perspectives, this, this could be fine as a car, you know? Uh, this, the nugget of this idea, though, driving a vehicle around, kind of stuck with me. And we'll see that come back in a later prototype. There's a ton of Mad Max games already. There's a ton of them. So many. If there's one thing people like, it's a po post-apocalyptic uh, hellscape filled with uh, cars and zombies. I made a cards prototype. Because everybody knows if you want to make a roguelike, it's got to have some cards in it. And so I was just experimenting with what would cards look like? How would I mess around with them? Because this is something I didn't know. So one of the things that, you know, popped out at me as I was doing these, as I was reviewing these prototypes for this stream, was I realized um, what I'd been doing this whole time was just training myself on new ways of making things. And even though none of these prototypes came to fruition and became a game of any kind, I learned a lot of stuff by doing them. They were all kind of like a little mini game jam. I don't personally like participating in game jams because they're stressful and I have enough stress in my life already. And a three-day jam is just like, I, I ain't got time for that anymore. Uh, but I do these on my own schedule and there's no, you know, expected outcome. And I ended up learning a lot of stuff. I mean, this one, I learned a lot about 3D again just more stuff about 3D um, and, you know, how to shuffle a deck of cards and things like that. This, this, some of these skills came in useful later, but not for making a card game. Uh, but it's nice to know if I wanted to make a card game, I could. Uh, and who knows, maybe I will at some point. The, I think this one partly died too, because I was thinking like, gosh, now I have to make all these cards. Eesh, that seems complicated. And I didn't really know enough about card games to um, to continue with it. That's probably a good lesson too. Is like before you start making prototypes, you should probably <laughs> think about it for a minute. Unlike me, back in twenty twenty two, where I would just an idea would pop into my head and I would just go and make it, <laughs> and then go, well, now what? And I probably could have saved myself a lot of time if I just thought about it deeply for an hour and just thought about the next step after that what are you going to do then john what are you going to do then after you make the prototype what's the actual game that you're making i don't know it could have saved me a lot of time 
but yeah, it was good practice. It was good practice. And I'm, I'm glad I did these things. And like I said, going back through these again, I kind of see all kinds of stuff that um, I ended up using in later projects. I did a quick test on what it would be like to make a StarCraft game or a StarCraft light game. And I think this was partly, um, this was sort of a sub prototype for another prototype I was already making where um, you would control like a hero unit and it would go around doing things and you would have these guys and you had to defend them. But these aren't your, these aren't the purpose of the game. These are just gathering resources for you so that you can go and fight the bad guys. Um, it was sort of a tower defense game. Um, it was sort of like a tower defense Starcraft hybrid. Yeah, construct additional pylons, totally. And I think this game has also been made several times. Um, so this isn't an original idea, but just prototyping it quickly in Godot again, this is, and here, here we are in 2D again. So 2D prototyping was very quick and easy, um, was fun. I learned some things about doing this and I, th I'm not going to look at the code cause I'm sure if I looked at the code today, <laughs> I would go, wow, two, two years ago, I was a really bad programmer. But I could say that at any point in my career. Um, in fact, it's probably not even that long. It's probably like two weeks ago, I was a really bad programmer. And now I'm so much better than I was. Three D blight. I think this might have been the prototype that I was working on. Yeah, I think this is the one. So you're you're walking around with a little dude. I think this guy's all made with um, meshes in Godot as well. Nothing fancy here. No three D modeling here. And then um, I put in some guns. I put in some shell casings flying around. I put in this idea of a of creep, you know, basically like Starcraft style creep that's just expanding every round and you have to contain it. So you're shooting it, you're hitting it with your flamethrower, uh, and then you're running over here and you're protecting your resource gatherers. And then you're going over here and you're building like fences. Um, kind of, I don't know, atomic crops or I think there was a cool game that was made with this concept. Um, I can't remember the name of it. it. Came out a couple of years ago. It may have been around this time, so I, I was probably influenced by it to some degree. But this idea, it kind of, if you look at it, it kind of combines the car game, right? So I have the 3D movement mechanics that I had already prototyped. It has the resource gathering stuff, or it would have, you know, that I was working on could potentially become a game, um, like a tower defense -y type game, but I don't know. I can't even remember why I moved on from this one. I think around this time I was feeling kind of burnt out because remember I was doing these right after I had published Gravity Ace and I was in that whole, I was trying to deny the, uh, the feeling of post-launch blues that I was feeling, uh, but you can only do that so long. You can only do it so long. And then I moved on and did, what was it called? This, here it is. This one. You guys ever play XCOM? So the idea here was to make a game like XCOM, but without any of the boring bits. So I've got one soldier there. I've got another soldier here. He's got two action points. He can attack somebody. And there he goes. And he can attack somebody. Like that. And then we can confirm those. And that guy's dead. And you do another round of movement. So it's like <clears throat> the boring bits of XCOM are all the flying back and forth between base and like choosing the mission and 
launching more satellites and building radio towers and you know it's I, I don't really care about that stuff so much I just want to I just want to get into a situation where I'm fighting some dudes and then the battles in XCOM would last like they could last like 30 minutes to an hour you know and I was like I don't have that kind of time I need to be able to resolve this in 10 minutes so this was going to become sort of a tiny tiny XCOM where you could just hit play you're given a scenario you can play through the whole scenario in 10 or 15 minutes you can play like two or three of them in half an hour 45 minutes something like that and then you could you know, do it on your lunch break or whatever. I thought that would be a fun game. Um, but <laughs> once again, after I got this far, I was like, boy, this is a big game. Like making a small version of XCOM is pretty complicated. And I think I could still do it, but I think it would, maybe at the time, actually, maybe at the time, like here I am now in 2024 thinking I could probably do this in a year. But back then I was thinking, gosh, this is like a three or four year game. There's no way. So things have changed for me, right? Since I came this, since I made this. So I'm glad I kept the prototype because it may be still something I want to make. I kind of don't think so, though, because my tastes have changed. I've The world has moved on a little bit. You know, there are new things that are popular and uh, in fashion now in the game world. But also my tastes have changed, and I'm less interested in making this game than I was at the time. Today on... Godot Public Radio with Johnson talking about his inner turmoil. We need more fun bite-sized games. Turn-based games are more than you would expect. Hey, Cameron. Hey, you guys. Cameron. So Cameron worked with me on uh, Domekeeper. Cameron did all the music for Domekeeper. So if you like the music, give Cameron a pat on the back. He did a great job. I, I definitely have played too much XCOM Solar. Definitely. I think I've played a thousand hours between XCOM, the the two remasters that they did, or the relaunches, the, the Firaxis ones. Probably spent about a thousand hours on those. I'm kind of dreading if XCOM 3 ever comes out. There's a device called Opticon that's in use more and more that allows an emergency vehicle signal the upcoming light to change to green, but people are still idiots. <laughs> you guys talking about intersections. So then I took a break. I took like a six month break. And uh, that was about the time that I realized, you know, this isn't really working for me. Like I'm, I'm not coming up with any good ideas. It's hard for me to concentrate. I mean, this is also like, a lot of this was during the pandemic, like in 21, I was still pretty shook from the whole uh, COVID thing. By 2022, I think we'd all gotten kind of more used to it. I was more used to it, but I don't know. I think collectively we all have a little bit of uh, PTSD from it. Um, and, you know, releasing a game, working on Domekeeper at the same time, it's just a lot, you know. I never did play the original XCOM. And I never played any mods for it either. Yeah, I don't feel... I don't personally feel bad about failed prototypes. And I don't think actually any of these failed. It's just that, you know, you take a prototype to a certain point And then it either becomes a game or it doesn't. In most cases, it doesn't. And there's probably good reasons why it doesn't, right? But you learn something from it, whether you, whether it becomes something or not. You either learn that, you know, it was a good idea, or you learn that, you learn that it was a bad idea. And that's just as valuable, right? And then later, sometimes you can't judge. So sometimes you just need some time. You know, you need some space away from it, and then you go back to it later, and then you can understand it better with a little bit of time and experience and 
just distance from it. This is a common thing to do in art as well. If you're drawing something, you got to like look away from it for a while and you come back to it with fresh eyes. And you see all kinds of things that you didn't see before, all kinds of stuff you didn't notice before. All right, we're going to get into the good stuff now. We'll get one more crappy prototype and then I think we got some interesting ones that we can start looking at. Uh, we might be in the Godot 4 era now. Let me bring up this. Yeah, Godot 4.0. Hmm. Yeah, let's do it anyway. I don't know if this will even run. I think I still want to make this game at some point. Um, yeah, let's run that. Anything? Anything? Nothing to see? There it is. Okay, cool. So, what I was building here, if you're, if you know anything about woodworking, you know these are kind of the, um, the cutaways for a dovetail. And what I'd done was made it so that you could actually parameterize it, change the angles, um, say how many you want. Say, let's say 80, and then I'll say three, or you could say I want 10. How far apart they're spaced, maybe eight. I think all these measurements are in millimeters. Not sure. <laughs> um, but the idea was to build a tool that lets non-professionals, amateurs, people who don't have a lot of experience building things, to actually build nice looking things in this game. But then it gives you the actual plans to make the thing in real life if you wanted to. Um, right down to giving you a material and cut list for, the, for all the wood. And telling you where you could source it even. I think I still want to make something like this, but I don't know. And then you turn it into a game by um, adding very light uh, like elements to it, like, um, like if you want to cut these, right, you actually go to the store and you buy the saws that you need. You set up, you know, you can set up your workshop, right? You can imagine like a whole 3d view where you're slowly building up your woodworking workshop and you get little quests to build. Oh, we need a, a chair, you know? And so you have to go and design and build a chair as a quest and then you can go outside of your shop and there's like a forest and you could even go out and harvest logs and cut down trees, plant trees, right? You could make this whole thing, but centered around making actual things. So there could be a game side of it, but there could also be like a more practical side of it where you just go right into the sandbox mode where you're just designing things. And then it tells you based on what you designed, here's the instruction sheet for how to actually make it. First, you got to buy this many boards. They have to be this big. Here's where you cut them all. Here's how you join it all together. Gives you all the steps, you know? Um, other people have attempted this and quit for one reason or another. And I think probably, my guess is that most of them quit because they realized it's an expensive project to make and not many people want it. <laughs> not many people want it. And so the audience is kind of limited and, and um, so it's a money loser basically is why I think most people haven't made this game, but we'll see maybe one day still. And then, out of nowhere, 
I started building nano gun. And if you've been here through this whole last half hour, hour, whatever, how long we've we been doing this, if you've been here for the past hour, you've seen several prototypes. And I think when you see nano gun, uh, what? <laughs> we did look at legs. It was, um, like a little Godot head with spider legs. It was not very impressive. <laughs> But if you look at this now, you'll see a lot of the different ideas that we had in all those prototypes kind of coming together finally, um, like a year, year and a half later in, uh, in the form of nano gun, which was, uh, you know, everybody was making vampire survivors games last year. And so here's my version. Uh, I did get it to the point where I had these screens, which is cool. These are all locked. There's no actual content here. It's just hinting that there will one day be content there. You pick your ship, your nano gun. You pick uh, where you want to fight. So this is like a, I think the vision here was something more like a FTL style world map where you can pick the region that you want to attack first. And then within the region, there would be several different missions. Right, and then you can pick the mission that you want to play within that, and then that would kind of branch out in some way. And then you get to shooting. So this combined a lot of uh, 3D. Um, this one did actually use some Blender models, but it also looks suspiciously a lot like the uh, car game driving prototype. This interface feels suspiciously like the cards prototype that I had worked on. Um, there's sort of a inverted resource gathering mechanic here where I'm just harvesting health from these guys. Um, and I have to kind of fight off these enemies at the same time. So this feels a bit like that um, mech prototype that I was making. So kind of all those different ideas came together a little bit here in this. This thing auto shoots. The enemies are not very interesting looking. For as much time as I spent on them, they're okay. And maybe they're fine. But this this goes back to the idea I was talking about earlier where I wanted to find something more simple. Like what's the simplest version of this idea I can make? And this didn't feel like it. And I wanted to make something, I don't know. A little more not I don't know I, I keep coming back to the word pure but that's really wrong just more maybe less complicated is the right word <clears throat> this game looks pretty simple I think a lot of games look pretty simple but they're actually surprisingly complicated they're hard to make I think we all know that Um, but it's good to be reminded and even something seemingly simple like this, it's probably every developer is going to have a different experience with it, right? We all have come from different backgrounds and whatever. <clears throat> and so what's simple for one of us may be really hard for the rest of us, you know, and vice versa. Part of this was just exploring, like, what is it about these games that people like? And I, I get it. I, I think I understand. Um, but at the time I was making this, it was less clear to me. Now it's more clear, right? So again, time, experience, like a little distance helps um, figure these things out. I ended up putting this one up on the shelf for a little while as well. I think the last time I worked on it was like last summer. 
and I've put it away since then and just, oh god, oh god, I'm about to die. Just working on other things. But it never kind of goes away, you know? It never fully goes away, and then it crashed. <coughs> the idea is always there, like in the back of my head, you know? And sometimes I'll have an idea and go, oh, that would be a good fit for Nanogun. Or that would solve this problem that I was having with Nanogun. And uh, I'm just, I'm sort of just trusting my subconscious to just keep working on these problems in the background. And one day they just go, I've got it. And you wake up one day and you have the solution overnight, right? It took a year and a half of dreaming. But one day overnight you have the solution and then you can make the thing. I'm still kind of waiting for that. Uh, with nano gun, but I think I had a sort of a eureka moment with it um, recently, and um, I've changed my process though a little bit. So, like I said before, I was kind of just making prototypes and then just running with them and seeing what happened. Now I'm thinking like two or three steps ahead. That's my new process, and we can talk about that a little bit more if you guys are interested in hearing about it. This was just f silly fun that I made for an event that I went to. Every year we do an event called uh, Ambitious Ales. We're actually doing them multiple times per year now. Uh, so if you're in Long Beach, whoops. If you are in Long Beach, California on September 4th, please come out and uh, we can uh, have a beer together or something and play video games. Uh, look up uh, Ambitious Ales on Eventbrite and you'll, you can get a free ticket. You don't need a ticket, but that has all the info about where it is, when it is, that sort of thing. It's basically just a bunch of indie developers in Southern California, both, well, a bunch of game developers in Southern California, both independent and industry people. We all come together. We meet at this pub. It's called Ambitious Ales. We take over the whole front patio and we play video games all night long. And I'm using the opportunity to uh, play test the project that I'm working on now. And it's always great to just see random people coming in. There's a lot of people who are just like a little buzzed. People who don't normally play video games. Um, people who play video games but don't know who I am and have never seen what I'm working on before. That's very useful. So you get all kinds of cool feedback from these people. That's, that's why I'm doing it. Anyway, it's a good time. You should come if you can. I'd love to see you there. So I made this for one of them, I think, I, last summer. And I made this in a weekend. This is, again, like a personal game jam project. And it did stress me out. But this was a lot of fun. And this was just... Uh, sort of a break from everything else I'd been doing. Uh, it allowed me to just do something completely different from what I was already doing. Uh, it was small so I could finish it, right? I could actually ship this in a reasonable time frame and just be done with it. And <laughs> I don't know if you've ever felt this feeling, but like sometimes it feels like I haven't finished anything in three years. And it's frustrating. And so getting a little quick win is nice, right? And just being able to finish something and publish it and put it out there for people feels good. Uh, everybody should try and do that as much as they can. I don't think I can play this with just the keyboard. I'm not sure. That was it. I was trying to make a game that I thought would be fun for drunk people to play at a pub. And so two people would walk up, <laughs> usually two buddies, they'd walk up, they'd grab the controllers, and then they would stab each other. 
And then they'd go, no, 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 that didn't count. Let's go again. So it succeeded. And it was fun to watch people play it. And, but more importantly, it was fun to make. And you can play it online. It's here at my itch. Um, it's actually a pretty bad game. <laughs> the mechanics don't make a lot of sense and they're hard to explain. And um, it's simple, like two button game, but the problem with the design is that you don't, there's no broadcasting what the player is going to do. It's sort of like playing rock, paper, scissors with somebody, which gets boring really fast, right? Um, but it, like I said, it was fun to make. I made the music for this game. I made all the sound effects. I made all the art and I shipped it in uh, like three days. And it felt great to just finish something and be done with it rather than, you know, keep slogging through uh, what I'd been slogging through for a long time. Sometimes you need a break. I guess that's the lesson there. Intermodal. Is that not in here? Maybe I don't have it. Maybe I didn't call it that. Maybe I renamed it. I wonder if I lost the 2D version of this. Was it this one? Oh, this is it. I did a game jam. This was uh, Ludum Dare in 2023, the one that ended in October. This was just another example of like finishing a project. And this is where game jams are actually good if you can handle the stress. This was done in 13 hours. Um, and I did everything except the music for this game. Uh, I think this version has music. I'm not sure. Yeah, I didn't do this music. Uh, the credits are in the itch page. But it felt good to like finish a prototype. And the nice thing about this prototype was that people actually liked it. <laughs> people got pretty excited about playing it. Uh, you know, friends were sharing scores. and uh, It's a nice thing when you get people who... I mean, it's nice when people say they like your game, but it's even nicer when they actually play it more than once because then they really mean it, I guess. <laughs> so this is a game about shipping containers and this has sort of morphed over time into what I'm working on now. Um, sometimes you get lucky with like a, building a prototype that it actually does turn into something more. Uh, but again, this is like, this was like end of 23. So it had been like, close to two years of just building prototype after prototype after prototype and trying to figure out like, what am I going to work on next? Um, and then this was around the time I think that I stopped working on dome keeper and just wanted to pick up a new project. And then I did this prototype. I did this one in a month, I think of like, I don't know, a couple hours a day, like maybe, maybe up to 10 hours a week, something like that for a month, maybe six weeks. So I probably spent like, I don't know, 40, 50 hours on this, just, you know, basically a week, week and a half of full-time work getting this prototype made. And this one was actually a really good education in a lot of different things, uh, terrain, um, mesh instances, optimization, shader programming for like the grass and stuff, um, vehicle movement, um, all kinds of stuff. This was like a huge learning process for me. And I'll just run it and we can see, like it combines a lot of different ideas from old prototypes as well, right? there's like a day night cycle in this game like if, if you're ever putting a day night cycle in your game <laughs> it means you're making too big of a game probably and you need to cut it out if you put a day night cycle in your game it probably means your, your game needs a team of 10 people but this started out as just like a test of how to make a vehicle move around again 
And you can see, like, from that first car prototype I made to this one, I'd learned a lot, and I'd made a lot of progress, right? I think knowing what I know about this, I could make a much better um, vehicle game now uh, than I could back in 21 or 22 when I was working on that first prototype. So just, you know, your skills change over time. This is using the Godot vehicle controller, which is a little fiddly, but it's pretty good. It's a little fiddly. It's, it's a little hard to configure, but it works well enough. It feels very convincing and realistic, the way it moves around. And then I've got like a nice little camera thing on here. I can move around. I can like put the camera at different spots. I was I built this little tool just so I could record different um, like screenshots and stuff. If I wanted to gap, capture some screenshots for social media or whatever, I put this little tool in. You can change like the time of day. You can have it be night and then it turns into sunrise. There's the sky getting lighter. Here comes the sun. You can make it be sunset, sun's going down, pause it, change the angles, right, do different screenshots and videos and things like that. But there's not much of a game here. I have a gun. I can move forward and back. I can move at different speeds. Oh, that's the cliff. Go away from the cliff. Is this the way down? I don't know if I'm heading north or south. I have a compass, but I am ignoring it. I think I'm heading the right direction. Nope. I'm completely lost. Let's start it over. This game originally started out as sort of like some kind of like open world defending the universe from zombie apocalypse type of game. And um, the concept just became too big. Definitely fun to drive around in this thing, though, and shoot things. So I think there's something here. Um, but this game definitely needs to be simplified a lot. Like, to make the original idea of having this open world um, zombie apocalypse base building tank roguelike thing would take me probably four years to make. Or a million dollars and a year, and I'd have to hire like a bunch of people, and we could probably make it in a year. Um, maybe for maybe for half a million, I could hire like five people. I could hire like five people, maybe for half a million dollars, and we could make it in a year, maybe a year and a half. Or I could make it by myself in five. Or, I need to find a better, smaller, simpler version of this, which I haven't found yet. Which is why I abandoned that one. Didn't abandon it, but you know, put it up on the shelf for a little while, till the timing is right, till, till the idea is right. And then that's how we got to Ridiculous Shipping, which is the working title of the current project. And this is the um, the game uh, uh, intermodal from the game jam that we showed just a minute ago, the 2D one. Except now it's 3D, but still kind of plays like a 2D game. And you can see here's the port. There's ships that come in. 
but I'm just going to, there's upgrades now so I can like get extra tractors and I can buy more, you know, little upgrades for the tractors. I can get drones to, to come into the game. I can buy those. I can get more entrances. You can buy more storage areas. There's cranes you can upgrade and buy. Uh, I was, I've been back on this game. Like I said, I did the, I did the prototype last year in October and then I worked on it for about, I don't know, a month or so converting it to 3d. And then I put it away until like last month, I think, and then started working on it again. So this was a game that I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it either back in October of last year and then worked on other prototypes in the meantime. And then one day I woke up and said, oh, you know what? Here's how I make this game now. And then started making that game. Get all the drones going, get these guys going. And we start earning money by unloading these containers. And so there's a lot to make with this game still. It has a long way to go but I know how to make it now. And that's a big thing. Like knowing what you're making and how you're going to finish it is huge because now you can start scheduling. Uh, you can start planning. Uh, you can start, you know, s reducing scope if you need to, because you know what the scope is and you can start thinking, Oh yeah, the scope's just right. Or it's too big or it's too small. I can add some things. It's never too small. So we've been making progress on this game for about like a month or two now. Yeah, that's an upgrade that you can get to make them drift. It is called ridiculous shipping. It needs to be ridiculous. So there's a lot of content I have to make for this game, but the basic game is done. Now I just need to make some content for it, get a demo out, see if I can find a publisher for it, which is hard right now. It's really hard. Money's still real tight. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what I can do. Uh, if I can't find a publisher for it, I'll just self publish it again. We'll see. And who knows, maybe I'll find the right publisher. Maybe I won't, maybe I'll find a publisher, but they suck. You know, I can't predict the future. We'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the journey over the last couple of years. And Again, with this game, you can kind of see there's cars. So there's some vehicle mechanics. There's some 3D going on. There's upgrading. The, an earlier prototype of this actually had cards that you could get and would shuffle through a deck and you could get random ones. So a lot of the ideas that I've been working on in those prototypes kind of came into this game in one way or another. And the experience that I got along the way kind of enabled me to program this game. Uh, it, I don't think I was capable of making this game like two or three years ago, right? It just took some time to learn all the things I needed to learn. It also took Godot 4 coming out uh, for it to be made because before Godot 4, I don't think I would have made a serious 3D game, but with Godot 4, it, it's a lot easier and it's a lot better and 3D and Godot 4 is great. Sorry, I'm not frozen. Just my phone's binging. My phone is being bonging. <laughs> I've been ignoring the chat this whole time. Not ignoring, but I'm a bad streamer. I'm a video game developer who, some, who streams. I'm not a streamer who makes video games, so I'm bad at the streaming side of this thing. Ugg Squish, I like how this game is the fundamentals of all your other learning experiences. Right? Like you can't, that's what, like I said, like when I was looking back through those prototypes, I, I could see a little bit of this game in all of them, almost all of them. I could see how the experience of making those prototypes led to this in some way. And so even though they were failed prototypes, they were still important 
to have done, you know? It costs so much less to make games when you work on your own and don't pay yourself properly. <laughs> right, if you can live on uh, spam and cheese and, um, you know, not worry about cozy things like roofs or uh, proper heating... You can, you can make games for a lot cheaper. <laughs> it helps too to live in a place that doesn't cost as much as it costs here. I think gasoline is still $5 a gallon here. And also, like the things that I'm saying, don't, don't take it as like rules, right? This is just the stuff that worked for me. And you'll, tell, you'll hear people all the time telling you, make a small game, make a small game. But if you don't want to make a small game, then don't make a small game. Make a big game. It's fine. It's fine. Do what makes you happy. You know, life's too short. Do what makes you happy. Life's too short. It's later than you think. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Old shareware game you played back in college called Treadmarks that this game reminds me of. A friend was telling me about a helicopter game uh, that it, this reminded him of the tank game. Uh, it's funny that he, it reminded him of a helicopter game, but I can't remember the name of the helicopter game now, but basically it was a mission game and you would go and do these missions and you fly around, you blow stuff up and that was it. And, uh, that's a great way to simplify that tank game. Just take out everything else, the open world, the zombies the you know all this stuff that i was thinking of adding the building your base you know meeting the neat people it's it can be less like dredge and more like just just running trees over with your tank that would be more be more fun it's a tank right let's run some trees over let's run over light posts let's get uh crazy in san diego and run over some cars um so I may come back to that with a simpler version of it. We'll see. Always pay yourself first, huh? That's smart. Desert Strike. Yes, that was the game. Hey, Cricket. Desert Strike with helicopters during the uh, Desert Storm kind of era. Which I don't know. I guess everybody knows about that. I don't know. I, if you're not American, maybe... I don't know how big that was in other parts of the world. Let's not talk about politics and war. So I think what I'm going to do right now is maybe work on this game for a little bit. Um, I want to design... A level so there's a port in Samoa called Pago Pago and I want to design that port a little bit so I want to get some trees in here I want to try out the new Godot FBX importer and see what that's like I'm still learning stuff you know especially around 3d like I there's like a ton of stuff around 3d I still am not super comfortable doing or or don't even know how to do um, so I was thinking, let's do that. And if you want, you can ask questions. We can code together. Uh, I'm happy to talk about my experiences making games, or if you have any problems that you want help or advice with, I'm happy to help with those if I can. No stupid questions, but first, First, I need to go get a, um, a drink of water, take a quick stretch break, and then I'll be right back. And if you guys have the, the means, you should also take a quick stretch break and get a glass of water. And I'll meet you back here in two minutes.
Hey, everybody, we're back. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. Who is this guy? He's kind of a weirdo. Are these Godot streams always this strange? This guy's like, is he, is he okay? Let's see if we get any questions. Question. How many people here are curious about Godot but aren't using it currently? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Did anybody answer that? Sorry, Godot, I'm taken. That's fine. You want to use other engines? That's fine. You're wrong. <laughs> no, it's fine. I always tell people, use the engine you hate the least. They're all free to try. Everybody's different. Try them all. Try them all, you know, and then uh, see which one you like. Use that one. I think Godot's great for a lot of reasons. Um, it it runs great on Linux for one, and I'm over here running Linux like a weirdo, but it runs great. Another really nice thing about Godot compared to other engines I've used is that it builds for every platform like right out of the box, which is also like fairly amazing. And I've had no trouble building for Windows and Macs even. And from good, my Linux machine, which is like kind of magical and fun and cool. It just makes the whole distribution problem really easy. And it makes it, which it can be a chore with other things, you know, like you're talking about like a JavaScript engine. You're like, oh God, now I got to wrap the whole thing in Electron or something. If I was playing around with like um, compiled languages before, whoa, we lost the question. There it is. I was playing around with compiled um, languages and stuff before, and those are kind of a hassle just because like the whole compile cycle is kind of, it just hurts my, my brain. I don't like, I don't like waiting. I don't like waking, waiting 10 seconds to run something, you know, I just want us to see it. I have no patience. So Godot has a lot of good things going for it. But use whatever you like, and different people are going to like different things, and that's totally valid and fine. You're using Game Maker, but you're looking at trying Godot in the future. I mean, I've yeah, you should try it. I mean, it's free to try. You might like it better than Game Maker. You, you probably, I mean, every engine has its little quirks, right? So when you're switching engines. The hardest part about it is is learning the engine itself. And so Game Maker and Godot do things like completely differently in a lot of ways. Uh, so you're going to have some friction at first, right? It's going to be hard to switch, right? This is why people have trouble switching between Mac and Windows or between Linux and Windows or between Firefox and Chrome or whatever it is. Sketch and Illustrator, right? It's because it's just, everything's just a little different. It's just hard to switch. Um, and there's nothing forcing you to switch, but if there's some features in Godot that you really want to do, or you want to experiment with it, just try it with an open mind and see what you see. You may like it. You may not, you may switch, you may not, but like I said, they're all free to try. And, uh, you can make like one way to, one good way to try it out is to take a project that you've already done in the engine you've done, right. That you use something small, something you could port in like a week and then because you really understand that project really well and how it works and what the problems are on the other engine that you're using. You just port it over in a week to Godot and see how it is. That'll be a good, you know, test of like, it'll be a fair comparison, right? Between what you're using now and what and Godot. So you can like make an evaluation of whether you want to switch or not. Yeah. 
You shouldn't switch. Yeah, what Valiant's is saying is right. You shouldn't switch just to switch. Do you have a language preference when working in Godot? I do. Uh, so I write everything in GD script. That's the question right there from Bleeding Chev. I write everything in GD script, and I like GD script a lot. I think GD script gets a lot of. I don't know. It gets a lot of love, but it gets a lot of like questions as well. Um, I think I saw something on Hacker News just yesterday where somebody was like, "Yeah, but what's up? What's the deal with GD script? Like, why are they trying to reinvent the wheel and make a new language?" And I'm like, "It sounds like you haven't even tried it because if you did, you'd know." that you can just press F5 and in about two seconds the game's running. Try that with your Rust game engine or whatever. It's going to take like three minutes and you're going to go twiddling your thumbs while you're waiting to iterate on your game. It's and, and Anyway, it's not the language that's going to be holding the game back, right? The players don't care what language your game was written in. <laughs> here's, a, here's a game dev secret. Players don't care what language the game is written in. They only care if it's fun to play. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that's a pro tip. Yeah, people complain about the efficiency with ever having actually used it and never understanding enough C++ to dig in and understand. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's it's a common thing with programmers, right? Uh, to prematurely optimize things. And one of the first optimizations you can do is say, I need to pick a really, really fast language because of reasons. And they haven't even written a line of code. They don't even know what game they're going to make yet, but they know they need a fast language for it. And I'm like, okay. Some of them even write their own engine, you know, to begin with. And, uh, you know, it's fine too. I just see a lot of those projects end up not being actually shipped at the end of the day. Um, make it that what you will, I guess. Um, it's just not like, I, I, I don't think it, it's, it's the wrong place to optimize. What you want to do is you want to make as much of your game as you can, as quickly as you can. And then when you need to optimize parts of it by making parts of it go fast, then rewrite those parts. And this gets back to the question we had, which was, uh, do you have a language preference? Yes, I do. It's GD script. And is it ever appropriate to mix GD script and C++ or C sharp, whichever the other language is? And the answer is yes, it is. And Godot lets you do that. They have a whole extension system called GD native, and you also have access to all the source code, C++. So if you want to, you can write most of your game in GD script. And then if you did have some very performance critical sections of code, you can write those sections in C++ or C sharp or, or Rust or whatever and have the fast bits run the fast code and have the rest of it run the easy code. You can even have your GD script script the module code that you wrote in C++ or whatever. So you can like add functionality to the engine in C++ and then script it from GD script. You get the best of both worlds. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know that actually but it is something you can do. And in practical terms, like I've never ever had any performance issues with Godot. I think a lot of people are like, it needs to go as fast as possible. It needs to go as fast as possible, but really it doesn't. It needs to go 60 frames per second. And it's pretty easy to go 60 frames per second. It's really actually pretty easy. You can do it without even trying really with Godot. You can write really bad, unoptimized code, and it'll still run 60 frames per second most of the time. Um, I think I think for like 99% of games, you don't need to do anything. Uh, 
and you'll be running at 60 frames per second. And so if you put in a lot of optimizations and you were running at 60 frames per second before, and then you put in a bunch of optimizations that's still running at 60 frames per second, <laughs> nobody cares. It didn't make any difference. If you want the worst of all worlds, that's easy. Just write your game in JavaScript. Oh, is Godot good to make HTML game? It seems pretty limited right now when it comes to VFX. Well, I don't know what you mean by limited, but I've done all my game jams recently in Godot and they're all up on itch. I mean, we can take a look. They, in fact, they made um, a change recently with 4.3, which makes it better. It makes the HTML builds better. Um, let's see if I can do this. That overlay, by the way, you see down there with the, the spinning balls and the questions that I'm flinging around, that's also a Godot game. It's running on my desktop. It's got a transparent background. I learned last week that you can make a game that runs on a desktop computer with a transparent background and you can click on the little characters or whatever that are on the screen but you can also click through the transparent area onto the desktop so you can make little games where you have like a tamagotchi type thing running around on your desktop or you can like have a little plant that you water and grow on your desktop you can make these little cool desktop toys for people um, if you're into that type of thing, it sounds, I'm tempted. It sounds cool. I like, I wouldn't mind having like a little bonsai plant on my desktop that I can just go and trim every once in a while. And then also still just keep doing my work. Uh, so this was made in Godot works great on, we played this a minute ago in Godot, but it works great here too in HTML. This is with an older build of Godot too, uh, Godot, Godot as well. This was like Godot 4.0, I think. So 4.3 has a better loading screen. Um, it handles sounds better, but this works perfectly fine. All right, that's all HTML5. And that was just the build right out of Godot. This was built in Godot. This was built in Godot. This was built in Godot. Uh, Godot, Godot. This was JavaScript, I think. And this was a weird, obscure language called Hacks, which was made for basically making um, Flash games. Um, you guys know Lars Doucet, he makes his games in Hacks. This was Godot. I think this one was Godot. This was Godot. This one was Godot. This one, I think, was Godot. This one, I think, was Love 2D, and then I converted it to HTML. This was actually a fun game. I may do something with this game now that I'm looking back at old prototypes. So yes, Godot is fine for making HTML5 games. Short answer, it's great. Hey, Captain Anosa. Yeah, and as far as visual effects go, definitely check out, check out PVKK. That's the new one from Bip and Bits. I'm not involved in that project, by the way. But uh, it's the new one coming out from Pip and Bits. It looks amazing. It's Planeten Verteidigungskanonen Commandant, or in English, Planetary Defense Cannon Commander, something like that. And it's a existential dread, kind of horror adjacent game about pushing lots and lots and lots of buttons. It's a very, very. <laughs> I mean this in the best possible way, but it feels like a very German game. 
<laughs> oh, I've been practicing, Cameron. And uh, yeah, go check it out because it's made in Godot, just like uh, just like Domekeeper was. Domekeeper, by the way, also no slouch in the visual effects department, I think. And uh, and I'm I'm not just saying that because I made quite a few of the visual effects in that game, but whatever, it's fine. Like you you like what you like. PVKK takes it to another level with 3D and all this stuff. And I think they're doing like a, they're trying to win like a, a voter's choice award right now somewhere at some conference. So search their socials for the link. I'm sure there's some way you can help them vote and win the award. Doesn't the transparent background depend on the OS setting? I remember this has been an issue since some people have turned it off and such. I don't know. I know it works on my machine. I was testing it the other day with this thing. This is a transparent overlay. And I was testing it where I could click through and like interact with the background and it worked fine. So I don't know. I, maybe it works on Windows. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it works on Mac. Maybe it doesn't. I don't remember reading anything in the documentation that said it wouldn't work. Anyway, it's cool that you can do it. People want to program, what is this? Because people want to program. Uh, using a language more than building the game itself, especially when the game idea is not mature enough and the developer doesn't know exactly what he's going to do. Yeah, I mean, that is a problem, right? Like, people say, oh, I know C, so I want to make my games in C. And that's fine. That's totally valid. The counter to that, though, is... making a game is much more than the language. Like, the language that the game is programmed in is like 10% of the game, maybe 1% of the game. The game is 99% of the game. And the game doesn't care what language it is. It's hard to design a game. That's where most of your problems are when you're making a game. And then in terms of the actual programming activity, again, it's not the language per se that's the, the issue. It's the engine. It's the API that you have to learn. So like imagine using a language like Golang or something. Golang's pretty easy to learn, but it's really hard to learn the whole standard library because it's gigantic and it does a ton of shit. And it's the same thing with um, Rust, right? Like learning Rust itself is probably hard. <laughs> it looks hard. I haven't attempted it. I think I could pick up basic Rust in a couple of days. But that doesn't mean I'm going to be any good at making Rust programs because there's all the crates and the APIs and the Rust way of doing things that you have to learn. And that has nothing, almost nothing to do with the actual typing things into this computer screen, you know? Um, so, yeah, I understand the desire to stick with one language that you know, but I also would say some languages are better suited for things than others. And you should use the right tool for the job. And learning another language is usually never a bad thing. So, like, relax. <laughs> Did anything happen on the play date front? Not yet. Uh, I took another break. I didn't mention it on the stream just now. But I took another break from making games for Godot. And I made one for the play date. Which, if you don't know what a playdate is, go go look it up. Playdate console, they're fun. Um, but I haven't actually found time to submit it yet because there's the whole process of like filling out the forms for publishing something in the store, and it's always I just don't like doing it, so I haven't done it yet. Maybe I'll do it today. I'll do it this week. I I think I said that last week, but I'll do it. I'll do it. Hacks is kind of nice. I was doing hacks way, way back when I thought it would be cool to make flash games. And it was. It was cool. And it's actually a pretty decent language. I, I eventually moved away from all those code-centric engines because 
it just takes too long to build scenes when you can't just drag and drop and put things down. It's just too slow. So I switched to um, Godot as soon as I could. Yeah, the Defender's Quest games were hacks. That's uh, Lars Doucet. The engine sound is annoying with earbuds. Yeah, it was a little loud. It was a little loud for sure. German game for me is always those really crappy simulator games about road construction or something. For me, when I say German game, usually I mean like one of those uh, German board games. But PVKK is actually not like that at all. It's more like the cliche of Germanness, which is um, um, people who are very good at keeping schedules, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, like American, the cliche about Americans is that we are idiots who just work too hard and don't don't know how to take a vacation, which is actually true. So true. And we like our guns, which is true for a lot of people. Anyway, let's not get political again. Let's not get political. I use C Sharp and Godot simply because I wanted to try C Sharp, came to like it, and now I stick to it. That's great. That is great. Rust is complicated. Change my mind. Rust is easy. Change my mind. C sharp is my favorite language. I think a lot of people share that, that C sharp is their favorite language. C sharp is a good language. It actually is. And the tooling around C sharp is really good. Um, I think in Ubuntu even, like Microsoft makes it for Linux too. And .NET 8... I think is in Ubuntu is like a standard thing now. Like there's nothing wrong with, with uh, C sharp. Um, I think what maybe what people who are new to game development have a bad idea about is that they think, Oh, if I, if I already know C sharp, it'll be easy to make games in C sharp. And that's wrong. It's not going to be easy to make games in C sharp because it's always hard to make games. And, uh, yeah, what's a vacation? I don't know. I don't know. I'll let you know if I ever take one. C sharp isn't going to make your game any easier to make. That's, that's the only point I'm trying to make. Make games every day, easy peasy, but I never release them. That's fine too. Like there's no pressure. You don't have to. You can do things just for their own sake. And you don't have to always have an outcome for everything that you do. I mean, C-sharp might make your game easier to make if it's the language you're most proficient in. I, yeah, it's it's possible, right? But I think, and again, this is just my perspective as someone who has not a beginner. I'm not a beginner. It's been a long time since I've learned programming. So take this with a grain of salt. But like, if, God forbid, Godot ever explodes and disappears from the universe and I have to switch engines then I'll just switch engines and it'll be a painful couple of weeks and I'll have lots of things to complain about. But over a two year project, you know, of making a game and designing the game, retyping it in another language is like such a small fraction of that, that it's like a non-issue to me.
So I don't know what I want to work on today, actually. Oh, we were talking about... Yeah, we are talking about designing a small port. Why don't we just do that? Because I think that'll be more interesting for people to watch. This is like a difficulter problem, which is like a programming problem. It's less visual. It's kind of more boring. This, I think, will be more fun for people to watch. And I've already got a head start on it anyway. So let's just do that. Um, let me change the stage here to Pago Pago. I need to build a level chooser so I don't want to keep typing in level names here. But now if I run the game, I'll get Pago Pago and you can see it's basically empty. Boat pulls up, you can get a container off. You can buy more cranes, but like that's it. That's all it does. <clears throat> I need to move this crane away from the edge. It's like his butt is sticking out over the water there. Last night I revamped how these bubbles appear. So if you guys were watching my stream yesterday, you saw I was having an existential crisis about these bubbles and how they're overlapping things and how they're hard to see. And I, I revamped their positioning. I added a little curve to them. I moved them a little bit closer to each other. I gave them a little bit of a darker background. Um, they're just, I think I've mostly solved the problem I was having with them. Now it's pretty clear when you upgrade things that it's it's doing the thing. Yeah, I did the arc. Did I go over how you make your 3D assets? They're all looking pretty great. Um, no. But I can. I mean, we can look at it a little bit. Here's something that I think maybe people didn't know about Godot as well, is that it can load blend files directly now. So here's Pago Pago, for example, in Blender. If Blender will load, come on, baby. Come on, baby, you can do it. Blender. Blender, please. Please, Blender. Maybe if we... Oh, there it is. Hey, all right, great. So there's Pago Pago, the, the land mass of Pago Pago. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to do much else besides design the terrain in Pago Pago with Blender. And I could, like... I think at some point I probably want to add faces to the front of this and, like, make little hills and have a little bit more interesting terrain, but this is what I've got so far. I made this yesterday, and this is just like the base landscape for it. Um, if I open up this blend file, this has all the other meshes in the game. So this has like the cranes. Here's one of the cranes, here's the bigger crane. It's got the coins that you see. It's got these gates for the trucks. It's got the trucks themselves and their trailers. It's got the tractors, the drones, the buildings the fenders, the boats, it's got all this stuff. It's got all the little icons here. Um, here's the battery with the, like the charging status thing, uh, the spinner for selecting things, the out of charge thing, the dust particles, the drifting particles, like they're all here in this one blend file. There's also a really decent Blender plugin. There's nobody behind me. Oh my, god. oh my god. You made me look. You made me look. <laughs> I don't know if any of my sound stuff will work here today. Oh, it should, because I've got my... Spot, but you can't you can't redeem it can you because we're on a different stream I'll give you one I'll give you one for free 
Welcome to our show. Hack the planet. Hack the planet. Hack for those late night hacks. Don't cola. The soft drink of the elite hacker. Who are these guys? <laughs> Jolt Cola, the soft drink of the elite hacker. Everybody knows that. So I've got all these uh, these things in here, and uh, you can just drop the whole blend file right into Godot, like this. You put the blend file in Godot, and Godot just imports everything automatically. It's really cool. It does the um, it detects when the blend file changes, and it does a transparent like behind the scenes GLTF export from Blender and imports it into your game. And you don't end up with all these extra GLTF files everywhere in your scene, uh, in your in your project. You just have the blend file, and then you've got whatever you make from the blend file, and that's it. And everything else is just in the import folder, so it's not cluttering up things, you know. Uh, and it's nice because like any changes you make just happen almost instantly. So like we can load up Pago Pago here and just change the mesh a little bit like this and save it and then flip back to Godot and it reimports it and there it is. Just like we see it in Blender. Put that back, save it, flip back. Boom. It's as fast as that. You just have to tell Godot where Blender is, and that's somewhere in the editor settings. You have to have Blender installed, and then you have to tell Godot where Blender is, and then you can just use Blend files directly. Uh, does the Blend file work the same with animations? You have to export as a specific file. No, it, it'll work with animations and everything. So if you have... Uh, a scene in here and it's got some animations and there's a skeleton and you've got static bodies and collisions and all this stuff it'll bring it all into here as a scene with all that stuff and then you can just start playing the animations and using the thing it's pretty great for a long time one of the drawbacks with version three of Godot was that the 3D workflow wasn't this good. You had to go through an export process, then you had to import everything, and then you had to like tweak everything after you imported it. Now the materials, the meshes, the animations, <sighs> lights even, it all just comes into Godot and it's great. So what I'm doing in this game is I'm making the terrain in Blender, and then I'm making all the individual components in Blender, like these cleats, and then I'm bringing it into the game, and I'm using those pieces to build the levels. So you can see I've got cranes here, um, which are off the edge of the world. Let's move them all back a little bit. Nope. Why are you moving that way? Just move them all back a little bit so they're not sticking off the edge of the um, ground. And then I think I wanted to spend a little bit of time like trying to import a um, palm tree or something because this is the port that we're trying to make. Let me bring you a picture. This is the port of Pago Pago in American Samoa. And this is the actual like overhead aerial view of it. And it looks very lush and green. Here's the satellite view. And we're not trying to make an exact copy of it, obviously. We're not trying to make an exact copy of it. But I do want these things to sort of resemble the real life location. That way, um, everybody in Samoa will be like, hey, that's our house. I can see my house from here. And then they'll all want to buy it. <laughs> but, but I think there are some iconic things about Samoa that you probably don't see anyplace else, right? And some of them might be this jungle next to the port as an example. You, there's no jungle next to the port in Los Angeles, but here there is. 
And so I, I kind of wanted to put in like all these green spaces around the road and like put some trees in and put some big rocks here in the water and show like how the water is real shallow in parts of it and it's real deep in other parts. So there's some like fun decorating I wanted to do. One of the nice things about working on a project by yourself is that you can, if you get bored of one part of it, you can just work on a different part for a while. Whereas if you're, um, like I met the guy who works at Riot and his, uh, like a few weeks ago, whose job is just to make the guns. That's all he does. He's like really good at handles <laughs> and triggers, you know? And no matter what he wants to do, that's what he is. He's the gun guy. So he just does guns 10 hours a day, every day, you know, eight hours a day, whatever. I don't know how much he works. And that to me, I'm sure that's fine for some people. I think I would lose my mind if all I could do every day for a year was make guns. I need to switch around. So some days I'm doing programming. Some days I'm doing music. Some days I'm doing a little bit of art. Some days I'm putting palm trees in a level. Every frame in the original Tron, they rotoscoped someone's nose. Are you serious? That's insane. I mean, he probably got really good at that guy's nose. He was probably dreaming about it. So let's do this. This is an experiment that I wanted to do. Um, Pete. Pizza, poly pizza, poly pizza. I wanted to check out these guys and see if they had a tree. Because I think Godot is supposed to have like um, a good FBX importer now. And I wanted to just try it. Kenny makes a bunch of nice assets. Oh, that looks like a good palm tree. That one's a good palm tree too. That one's nine dollars. This one's free. Let's try this free one. Oh, is this gonna link me out to Unity? <gasps> the enemy. I don't know how to. I don't know how to. <laughs> they're not the enemy. <laughs> I don't know how to download this from Unity Asset Store. You probably need a Unity login or something. Okay, I don't want to do that. Low poly trees. 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 I don't know. Let's just try and see if there's one that we can download. This one looks nice. It's a little, probably way more detailed than I want. How about this one? Those are nice too. Little quad um, card based trees. What is the download? FBX GLTF format. Public domain CC0. Let's just try it. Let's download the FBX. I just want to try it. Normal trees. Absolutely normal trees. Nothing to see here. These are all just completely normal trees. And then I probably don't need to import them into Godot at all, right? Or I'm into Blender. Let's just put them in here and here normal trees, and then go to Godot. Look at that. It's importing normal trees. There's a bunch of information for mip map generation and blah, blah, blah. I just, I trust you. I don't know what any of that means, but I trust you. And then we look for FBX, and can I double click it? Look at that. Look at that. So we've got trees made of cylinders 
with materials on them. And we've got a bark material and a leaves material. We've got the individual materials here. We've got the meshes here. Why are these trees all laying down? Uh, I guess they were designed in something where the X and Z or the Y and Z were swapped. I don't know. They look good here. Maybe they're modeled laying down and then the objects, they straightened them up. I don't know. So we can make a, uh, a new inherited scene from that, from just directly from the FBX. And now we have all the trees here, right? Somewhere? They're way over here. Okay, so the origin is a little weird, but there they are. And we can just move these back here to the origin, right, in our new inherited scene. And there they are, they're in the game. So I can say with confidence that the FBX importer works great. And then if I wanted to, I could like just hide all those, or I could even copy this one and make a new 3D scene like that and just paste it there. Right, so now I've got this Godot version of the scene, which is just that tree with that mesh with these materials on it, these surfaces. There's the bark, there's the tree, the leaves. And then we can just, how tall is this thing? Can't really tell. I think it's like a normal size tree. Let's just save it. Uh, we'll save it as um, props, tree, scene. And then we can go into our Pago Pago port. And we can just drag it in. Whoa, it's gigantic. Oh, no, it's really close to the camera. That's the problem. Why are you so high up in the air? Here we go. So I don't think I like these trees in particular, um, but let's duplicate one. It is nice that I didn't have to model it myself. Can do that with it. Shrink this one down a little bit. Make this one a little bigger, maybe. Yeah, they felt a little squished. I don't think that's the import process because I think they looked a little squished here, too. Yeah, they definitely look a little squished here. It's a style. So now I've got a little grove of trees there, and if I run the game, I should just see them. Yeah, it's fine. Can upgrade this crane. Get the big crane there next to the trees. This, this tree does not match the style of the game. Right, it's too detailed. It's too furry. It's got too much stuff going on inside of it. It looks good closer up, but from this angle, from this distance, it doesn't look great. Uh, I had a feeling. Right, it's just too detailed. So uh, we're gonna have to do something about it. Um, 
one thing would be to find another asset that looks similar, but another thing to do would just be to copy this one, but simplify it myself in Blender. When you duplicate, does it create a new instance or does it use more resources and draw calls? I think what's going to happen is it creates an actual new instance of it, but they're all using the same material. So all these trees are all using the same two materials. So, and those two materials are going to be shared amongst all of them. And we can test that by like clicking one here, like this one and opening it up and changing this material to be like that. Actually, I changed the wrong one. Let's change this one to be like that. Save it and go back, right? They all use the same material because they're all from the same inherited scene. And the material is a shared resource unless unless you click that, and then each one will get their own copy of the material. So, so there's many trees, but they'll all use the same materials. So I'm not sure what that means in terms of draw calls, except I know that the material changes shouldn't be causing additional draw calls. And then if you wanted to, you could take all of these and put them inside of a uh, mesh instance. So you could do a, a multi-mesh instance 3D like this and put them all in there. And then um, I think what it will do is um, – wow, that's weird. That's big like that. It'll cull these if they're not on screen all together as a group. And it does some other magic to like reduce the draw calls because these are all together. Something like that. I'm not an expert on that kind of stuff. This this brings me back though to like performance optimization and how you kind of don't need it a lot of the times because I think this game runs at like 300 frames per second and I can put as many trees in here as I want. And it's still gonna run at like 300 frames per second. And I only need to run at 60. And this is on an old potato computer with a 1060 graphics card while I'm streaming. So it's in the debug build of the game. So it's only going to be faster in the release build when I'm not streaming without the editor running. It's only going to get faster. So as long as I'm hitting my 60 frames per second budget and I'm getting everything done in 16 milliseconds, as long as that's happening, I don't actually need to optimize anything. All right, folks, I need to take a quick break. I will be right back once again. I hope you're having a good time. I, I'm i questioning my entertainment value. <laughs> uh, but I'll be right back in a few minutes. It just occurred to me 
to find an FBX file or a blend file with some animations in it and bring that in and see how that looks. It doesn't even matter what it is. Let's find something fun on uh, Poly Pizza. This guy, we were looking at this guy earlier. Quaternius, let's download it. What do you got? You got an FBX and you got a GLB. So a GLB is a GLTF file, but it's binary version. Should have everything in it that we need, and we know Godot can import those. Uh, there's also the FBX, which Godot can also now import. With It should have all the animations and everything in it as well. Let's just download this one, because I'm just... I know there's a lot of FBX resources out there, so I just kind of want to try it, you know? He's got a name. His name's Barbarossa. And then let's just copy him again. Oh, into here. And then go into Godot and find him in our file system. Barb. What is this? This is his textures. That's cute. Okay. And then this is his FBX file. And look, it's got all the animations. You can even preview them here. Wow. This is one, this is my weakness, is making um, character animations. He can say no. He can stab. He can run. He can swipe. He can walk. He can scratch his head. I think all these animations have the same name. <laughs> oh no, there it is. Death, duck, hit, react, idle, jump. No, punch. Sword, walk. Oh, he can wave. Hey guys, that's what that is. He can say yes. Cool. So if we make a new imported scene here, new inherited scene. It makes a Godot scene from it, and you can see it's got the armature, it's got the mesh, it's got all the different objects. It's got Ernest, which I guess is the parrot. Yep, so you can animate the parrot independently from the captain himself. And it's got the animation play with all the different animations in it. And we can just set to walk in and have it auto start and have it loop can't change loop mode on animation emitted in another scene. <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, I think there's a way to fix that. We can actually import the FBX into Blender and add the dash loop keyword to the object, I think, or the animation, and then it would loop. But we can also just have um, a script on Barbarossa. We can do something like that and say... Um, Funk ready, uh, animation player dot get animation, uh, walk dot and then we could do anim dot what is this return? returns an animation. Loop mode. Like that. And then he'll loop. So we can just write a little bit of code to make it loop. No big deal. So let's save him out as um, yeah, he'll be a prop. We'll call him Pirate. Pirate Captain. Like that. And then let's put him in Pago Pago.
It's so gigantic. <laughs> it looks so huge. How do I get him to disappear on the ground here? There he is. If I run Pago Pago, we're going to see a little tiny little pirate captain just walking in place. Yeah, there he is. So small. That is pretty cool. That is pretty cool, I gotta say. Easy. Right? So then we just need to turn him into like um, a character body and then have him actually just move around, you know, as he's playing his animation. We can have him turn and rotate and walk and move in any direction we feel like. Um, and he'll be doing his thing. He'll be doing, he'll be doing this thing. Right? Just over and over again while he's doing his thing. You probably won't have giant ones. But it does bring up an interesting um, issue, which is that um, if I had him like at a realistic size, he's like impossible to see in the game. So that size is kind of okay. I think he still reads as a pirate. I think he's probably like 15 feet tall if he was in real life. But it's fine. He's got to be kind of cartoony to work in this game at this perspective, at this distance from the camera. Yeah, and that's fine, right? It's a video game. It's not we're not trying to be realistic. We're trying to be fun. He's just a little guy. You can also separate the animations from the file and the import options. That's cool. <laughs> Having a great time. Having an okay time. <laughs> Having a time. Uh, where is it? I can't, I don't know which one it is. Here we go. <laughs> These are dark times, John. Not that dark. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is a fertile land and we will thrive. We will rule over all this land. And we will call it this land. I think we should call it your grave. Ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. Ah, ah, ah. Mine is an evil laugh. Now die. Ah, oh, no, God. Ah, oh, dear God in heaven. Yeah, so this import doc. You can do all kinds of fun stuff. You can uh, skip importing certain things. You can like go to an individual animation and change some things. You can save it out to a file. So then you could add this animation to a animation library of some kind. Uh, you can look at the meshes. You can save out individual meshes if you want to, or you can actually save out all the meshes just give it like a path where you want all your meshes saved and then it'll save them all automatically like every time this file gets imported it's going to save them all there you can import materials uh, you can set animation save paths and it'll just re-import all the animations to a certain path uh, you can do materials and have it use external materials so what it'll do is it'll import this material once and then you can modify it in Godot and it won't overwrite your changes from then on. So if you wanted to bring it in again fresh from the, the model, you would delete your Godot version. It would bring in a new one from the, from the model. But otherwise, you can bring in your material and then you can tweak it in Godot and make it look really nice and then not have to ever worry about it again. 
Uh, you can extract all the materials in one go, put them in a folder that you want. And you can customize a lot of stuff like um, you can customize the root of the scene, like what type of uh, node it is. You can say it's th this thing's going to be imported as a character body 3D, for example, and you can call it pirate. So when it imports it, you just have this already set up and named the right way. You can have it scale things a certain way. So you can say this is actually, I want to import it at five times the scale. Um, lots of different options for doing the uh, import and everything that you can customize for every blend model. And then once you've got this set up, and usually you don't have to change any of these options at all. Once you've got it set up, then any changes to the model just automatically flow back into the game. So all the meshes get updated. If you change it, all the materials get updated, you know? And so if you're just using those things, they just change when the model changes. So the workflow is really nice. And this is super powerful. And the fact that it can just load binary FBX files and blend files without any fuss is a huge time saver. It makes working in 3D almost as easy as working in 2D with respect to um, the asset handling side of things. Because nothing's better than like saving a PNG and you flip back to Godot and there it is. That's pretty great. In Civ games, your troops are technically the size of mountains. Yeah, right? They can be whatever you want. Let's build a little um, road network. Uh, we need to put in like where we want the containers to go. So let's put the storage yards somewhere. Let's put one here. that that I want to change this um, snapping to be full units so we can duplicate him put him over here great Like that. Let's make this one um, already purchased. The upgrade here is going to be yard one. These will be at yard zero, so you haven't purchased them yet. This one's going to be pre purchased for you. And let's just have three container areas for now. Um, and then we're going to need a, a garage. Let's add a garage. Uh, we'll rotate it around like this. Maybe something like that. And then we're going to need, oh, well, let's make this, um, I think it's called Garage 1. And then we need a drone tower. Let's rotate that like that. Maybe let's do that. I know. Let's put it over here. that. 
Why would you have the drones park over by the wharf? Oh, who knows? Who knows? Let's just not think about it too much. Let's not overthink it. Let's just put it in and see how it feels. Then, uh, what else do we need? Oh, we need roads. We need roads. What is that? That's the ground's origin. Okay. So let's make a A star network. So we're going to add a A star graph. This is a node that I made for doing uh, building these A star navigation graphs. And this is going to be the tractor A star. And that is going to go there. That's for those guys. And the tractors, let's see, we need a node. The tractors are going to kind of go in a loop. They need to go from here, right? From the garages where they're born. that and they'll go this way oops they'll go out like this um, I put these, yeah, I guess that's fine. Let's put one in there. And then one in there. And one in there. Let's turn off the garage. I just want to see what's inside here real quick. A little fiddly, um, like working inside of another mesh. Connect those, connect those, and then drag this out this way. And then that can connect to that. And that can connect to that. You guys can all go like, let's say, let's say you go from the here out this way, and we can kind of go diagonal if we want to. That'll be kind of fun to get, kind of just have a, like a a non ninety degree straight path. Hey, Rafa Lagoon. Rating with a party of 91. Wow. Welcome in. I don't know why the alerts didn't go. Did an alert go? Did I just not see it? I didn't hear any sound for it. Welcome in. Wow. Can't believe you rated little old me. <laughs> just so you know, you guys, if you're rating from Rafa Lagoon, I'm not normally here and the stream is much better than this usually. <laughs> You should come back all week. There's a whole week of takeovers. Um, uh, I have the, the picture somewhere. I can prove it. Oh my gosh, my stomach. My stomach is making some terrible noises. Does anybody have the Twitter link? I don't have it handy. But there's like a Twitter that explains like what's happening this week. It's going to be great. Thanks for rating in. I, I assume you like Godot and you know if you're here and uh, I'm I'm just working on uh, uh, building out this um, this new level I'm working on for the game I'm working on which is a game about shipping containers I'll show it to you in a second so I'm building an A star network right now using a tool that I made for the game to help me build the A star networks 
And I think we want to connect those. And let's have it go. Actually, let's have this one. Let's move this one out here like this, and then we'll go this way with it. Okay, so then we can have this and this connect, and then have this and this connect. Excuse me. Oh, rats. We need another. Let me delete this one. Uh, let me actually delete that one too. We need um, a node here so we can get up this lane and we need a node here so we can go around the back. Like that. And then from here, maybe we connect both of those and also maybe we connect them here, like that, and this one to that one, like that. And maybe even this one to that one. Let's connect those too. So this is the network, the road network that our trucks will drive on. Uh, rats, I think I need, I think I need another node right in here. Let's, let's connect this put that there and then this one I need to build a slightly better tool for this because now this one a18 is connected to n15 and I want to disconnect that and 15 is connected to 18 but I want to disconnect that one as well okay right so then 19 will connect to 18. And I need something similar done here. Uh, maybe it'd be quicker if I just delete that. Delete that. And just drag it out here. And drag it out here. And then connect that to there. And then drag this out here and drag it out here and connect that to there. Okay. And then let's make a lane here along this front row as well to get to the um, cranes. So right there, right there, right there. And then we'll connect those like that. And we'll call this one, give it a weight. And this one, give it a weight. Give this one a weight. That will discourage vehicles from going down this road unless they really need to. And then we can connect you and you maybe and connect you and that's fine. Connect you and you as well. So they can kind of abort early if they want to leave this, this lane. Let's turn our garage back on. Ah, there we go. Thanks, Morcentis. Maybe like something, let's see, select the line, split it, yeah. What am I using in the tool script to draw in connection lines in 3D space? I'm just using uh, Path 3D nodes. So Path 3Ds will show up in the editor, but they don't show up in game. Anyway, I delete the whole node as soon as the game runs. But this way I don't have to do any drawing. I just make a path 3D node and that's visualized by default in the editor. I'm actually even drawing like a little um, arrowhead with it, like a real simple arrowhead so I know which way it's going. So I can have two-way roads or I can have one-way roads. 
I think this will work. Let's try it and see. There's our storage yard. We can buy other storage yards. We can unload this guy. I can barely see the tractor, but there he goes, following his road network to get there. Loads up, comes back. Yeah, he's following a weird path because all the roads are two-way, which is kind of fine. And this is off the screen, which is not so fine. This garage should probably be over here. And I didn't upgrade the drone tower, so I don't have drones yet. I can't make deliveries. That's interesting. I, I don't have trucks coming in yet either, though, so I can't make deliveries anyway. Okay, now I can buy a drone tower. Now I have a drone. But I don't have trucks, so I can't make deliveries yet. Let's move this thing over here and then make a path for trucks to come in and make deliveries on. So moving this is kind of a pain because now I've got to redo the road network. Like I want to move this here. But I also want to move all of this. Over here. I mean, it's not, it's fine. We're going to have a little bit of chaos with all these intersecting road segments. But it's okay. It's okay. It'll still work. We're just prototyping like how we want these roads to work. Um, it's a little, yeah, it's going to be crazy. And then we can change some of these roads too so that they're only one way. And that would force traffic to go in certain directions, but let's just not right now. And then let's make this be automatically upgraded to drone one. So we start with the drone. And then we need a uh, entrance for the trucks. And that'll be here. Yeah, let's put that there. And we'll upgrade that also to truck one. So that'll just start in the world. And we need another A star network just for the trucks. I could have them share a network, but let's not. So the trucks will start here and then they'll go down here, maybe like this, and then we'll have them drive right down the center of this lane and then exit over here. So we need an exit down there. All right, let's see if this is playable. Boink, boink, boink. Would you consider a, a controllable camera? Maybe. Maybe I would. Oh no. Oh, I didn't give it a, a assign it to the trucks. Let's try that again. Speed up time a little bit. All right, here comes the trucks. 
Yeah, so these these little tractors, they definitely drive a little oddly. Like this turnaround right there is a little odd. When uh, he's on a two-way road, it would be better if he was on a one-way road. But now I've got these these guys, and now I can send the drone out to start making deliveries. He's going to recharge. I'm already going to need another drone. I can't afford it yet. I just lost a dollar because that guy was charging. I don't know, what do we feel about this camera angle? It's hard for me to judge. I was playing the game from the other angle for so long, months now, that it's hard for me to judge if this is better or worse. Maybe it's just something I need to get used to. I kind of need fresh eyes on it. This is why I'm trying to get it to that game uh, event at uh, Ambitious Sales uh, next week so that I can get some people who've never played it before to play it. Dang, lost some more money. It feels very narrow, yeah. I mean, this particular level is designed in a narrow way. Um, it's not that there's, I don't know if it's that there's wasted space or if there's just space that's harder to use. Like I could just rotate this guy so that he's like more side to side and he aligns better with the bottom edge of the screen. And then, um, I could make the whole landscape, like I could move the camera a little bit so that this, this is more usable land. I don't know. Part of me is like, do you even want to have like all these different ports? Maybe, maybe just make the version with one port to start with. And it just gets wilder and wilder and wilder. Maybe you don't even need different ports. And then that would let me focus my attention on just building all the different things that the one place needs rather than trying to divide it up into a bunch of different areas. Let's get another crane going. I think I need another tractor. Aye, aye, aye. Deliver, deliver. Give me those. Here we go. Now we got two tractors going. Sound would help a lot with this game. I haven't done any work on sound yet. Also, I'm just noticing these tractors and like these guys want to deliver only to this side of this thing. And it would be useful if they could deliver to any of the four sides. Right now, they can only deliver to one side of it. Might be too high of an angle, yeah. It might be. Like, I need, might need to lower it, like, 45 degrees or something like that. 
I just switched this to the orthogonal camera yesterday, so I'm trying, still trying to figure it out. I think I, I do like the orthogonal camera. I think that's going to stay. But the positioning of it and the angle of it, all that stuff needs to change a bit. And there's a case to be made for having it real kind of low or much lower so that you can see kind of the background a little bit more. Um, it might be nice to show like what city you're in, maybe by putting some landmarks around the edges or, or something. Oh man, I can't afford the third drone. That's too expensive. I, I forgot to unload the ship. We're going to need another tractor stat. It's 10. Let's get these things drifting, shall we? <laughs> That's cool how he went around. He went around the truck. I was having kind of an unlucky streak. I wasn't making money fast enough because there was too many empty trucks going out. I st I'm still having trouble getting a blue. But we're up to 15 bucks now. This is $20 for the third drone. There's $3 right there. If I can unload them. And then there's a dollar for that. These got two blues are going to cost me though. Unload that, unload that. There we go. There's nineteen dollars. Can I get it? There it comes, there it comes. Oh, I got it. Okay, now I'm back to zero. And I need storage now. So now this guy can't deliver anything because these are full. And I can't deliver any containers. Oh wait, now I can. Because I didn't have any blues. Here come the blues. And I just need five bucks now so that I can um, get another storage area. And then I would want to buy another truck lane now at some point so I can have the trucks coming in faster so I can empty this out faster and then I can get another drone thing so I can get that going faster. And then I think by now too, I should actually start seeing bigger ships coming through and I want ships with items for sale to come through. Hey, fool box. Seriously, these raids are silent. I don't know why there's no sound coming through on them, uh, but welcome. Fool box will be hosting the stream, I think Wednesday? Ninja raid. <laughs> This game could use a chicken with a knife in it. You can make the port extensible by building new areas, maybe even give the player the possibility to organize his port by building his roads. I, I So I did think about building the roads originally, but ugh, maybe. It's just so complicated, and uh, I don't know if it's any fun to be building roads. 
it makes it kind of a different game. It makes it a very much a different game. Water at the bottom, action in the middle, sky at the top. Makes sense, Cameron. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it's kind of how the test level was designed. There was no angle on it at all. Maybe the, the whole idea of having this um, angle, this viewing angle that's kind of diagonal is a bad one. And maybe I just need to fix the camera pointed kind of north. And if I want to have any rotations, I just build the rotations into the the objects instead of trying to rotate the whole level. I'll, I'll have to experiment with that and see. Unrelated question, but could anyone recommend a research applied to numbers on a graph or a chart? I mean, there's Excel or Google Sheets, which work great for that. That sounds like a, a job for a spreadsheet. So spreadsheets are great at that. Google Sheets is free. I think Office is free. I think you can use it. I'm not sure. Um, if you wanted to use something more mathematical oriented, there's there's this thing, which is like a, a graphing calculator thing. But this is like for typing in formulas, and I don't know what the situation is like in terms of saving your work or anything. So maybe not. Like if I was going to do what I think you're doing, I would just use a spreadsheet. Hey, Connie. Hey, Logic Geek. Yeah, no problem. I mean, yeah. It has all the stuff you need. Spreadsheets are amazing tools. They can do anything. If you're thinking about tables of data with charts next to them, it's probably a spreadsheet. That can do everything you need. I mean, let's just try rotating the camera a little bit and see. So if we change this camera view uh, so that it's not rotated like that, if that's 30, and this is more like 60, right? And then this is 0, and this is minus 40, no, 0, 10. Seems fine, I guess. Um, yeah, like it doesn't seem any worse than the way it was. That's for sure. We've got this water up here for where a UI can go. So it's like empty space for all that stuff. We can still kind of zoom out a little further if we wanted to and put like docks on this side and docks on this side if we wanted to. We can even have like big cut-ins here and maybe have docks like cutting into the land a little bit. Um, we can have roads going over, like you could have an island over here and then to access the island with more storage area you need to build a bridge that would unlock the island and now you can access those extra storage areas. That could be fun. Um, yeah, maybe the, the whole angled camera thing is like rotated around the Y axis and how it was like all Dutch like it was before. Maybe that's just a bad idea. We won't do that. So I think we need to make some notes. <clears throat> And I think I actually need to make maybe, maybe it's very quickly. I think I'm coming up on um, the September 4th deadline. And I'll do the play test. And then after that, I think I might need to take a quick break from this game just for a little bit 
and just do some more design thinking on it and work on something else. Give myself a little bit of time and space and distance like I was talking about uh, earlier in the stream. We're real close, right? I just want to design like a nice looking port. And it doesn't have to be super nice, but I want to put some palm trees in. I want to put some rocks by the shore. I want to design this port and let, make it be fun and playable. That's what I'm focused on right now. Um, then after the demo, we can start thinking about new and different things. This is Notion. No, no, no. This is Obsidian. Is this Notion or Obsidian? This is Obsidian. I used to use Notion, but I don't anymore because I, I want to have control of my own files. So this is Obsidian. This is Obsidian, and it's got the uh, plugin for drawing called Excaladraw, which is really nice. Uh, we can do Excaladraw like this. And then it's got like this whole diagramming thing built in as well, which is nice. Connect those. You can type in them. You can do like freehand. It's like an infinite canvas. You can just keep drawing on it forever. You can embed these drawings in your other documents. Pretty nice. Yeah, Obsidian seems great. How about having it like in many motorways where it zooms out as you upgrade your stuff? Yes, perhaps. Um, probably not for the initial like tutorial port. Like this is like going to be the tutorial port is what I'm thinking. And so the basic tutorial port needs to have, it needs to be, you know, simple to understand and um, have be simple to play, simple to teach. It's over quickly, you know. You play this for maybe 10, 15 minutes and you win after you do all the tutorial stuff and you deliver, you know, 25 containers or something. Then you go on to the real levels. And those real levels, you might start with like this view. And then as you upgrade things, it goes out a little bit more and you go, oh, look, I have access to now to another drone tower I can buy. And then it grows a little bit more and you're like, oh, there's more storage yards over here, but I need to get a bridge. So you have to save up money to buy the bridge. And then it zooms out a little bit more. And then you have access to extra docks now. And you can bring in more containers. And um, more trucks and more tractors and everything just gets more and more and more and more and more. And then you make different ports by just having different land shapes with different geographic challenges built in and different things that you might have to buy in a different order. And um, special events that only happen in that area. Like you only get attacked by Godzilla if you're in Tokyo and you only get... Um, you know, containers full of heroin if you're in California. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, when you're in the Caribbean, that's where you get attacked by uh, pirate ships coming into port. And if you're in some, if you're in like Central America, that's when the containers full of velociraptors sometimes get delivered. And you need a special Velociraptor handling truck to come through. And you need to make sure you deliver the Velociraptor container to the Velociraptor truck on time. Otherwise, you're going to have Velociraptor problem. But those kinds of ideas will happen. They'll come with the levels, right? So as I'm making these levels, I'll, I'll think of two or three ridiculous things to add to each level to make them more fun and unique. Uh, this is meant to be just like the intro tutorial level. And I'm, I'm kind of mostly designing it to make a, 
as again, like an, a learning experience to try and experiment with how I would build the levels and how I would decorate them. So I want this one to be kind of as fleshed out as it can be and make it fun to play, but also make it really pretty. That's my goal here. Uh, and then if I build this and make it really nice and build a port chooser so you can choose the different ports and I can put a couple of ridiculous things in this one, like I've got the drifting now, but I need a couple more things, then that becomes something that you can show to somebody and say, what do you think about this game? Will you give me some money to finish making it? And then we can see if any publishers are interested in it. We'll see. I'm, I'm hopeful, but we'll see. They'll either say yes, or they'll say no. <laughs> and if they say no, that's fine. Uh, we'll just either, that's just another decision point. We either then just decide, well, let's publish it ourselves, but we'll maybe scope it down so we can be done with it and we can move on more quickly. Or, or we say, you know what, let's move on to a different project. This one's not working. I don't know. It's not, uh, you gotta, I don't know. If you're in this, like professionally, you gotta sort of have a little bit of coldness, I guess, maybe. You gotta, you gotta not be afraid of uh, abandoning your babies. <laughs> Throwing them out in the, in the wilderness to the wolves. Can't get, can't get too precious with all your little things. That goes for probably any art you're making. You got to be able to hit the delete key. You know, it's not that big a deal. Um, hey, if you're a Godot streamer, what you should do right now is go start your stream because I'm going to tell Nat that we're going to be winding up in the next half hour or so, and she's going to pick somebody to raid. Drop them off at the Idea Orphanage drop box. There's also that card game that I don't remember the name. Way better than the inbuilt one. The one from so oh, Stacklands. If you didn't have a real stupid, if you didn't have a stupid real job, you would. <laughs> Can't have a day job. So many people have a day job. Uh, I guess technically I have a day job as well. I just do it whenever I feel like. I basically work when I need money. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, well, this is verging into bragging territory, but I, I don't have a traditional job. I'm self-employed, so I can kind of make my own schedule, which is nice. Um, if you have the means... I highly recommend it. Yeah, that's the only reason to work, really. If you need money, you go do some work for somebody, and you make some money, and then you can buy some groceries. If you didn't need the money, can you really call it work? I mean, you can, right? But, like, I would do game development. Uh, I do do game development, even when no one's paying me. <laughs> But if I need to eat, I have to do some actual things for other people sometimes. And uh, if you're in that type of situation, a self-employed situation is not for everybody, but it is pretty nice. It has its perks and benefits. It also has its downsides. I'm not going to lie. It has its a lot of downsides. Uh, especially if you live in a state like I do, which has a high income tax. But um, yeah, be a lot easier if we didn't have to eat. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot easier if we didn't have to pay to eat. 
right? I would love to keep eating. I just don't like to pay for it. <laughs> Everybody else here watching this from work? I find uh, that there's a lot of shirkers at this time of day. <laughs> a lot of people who should be working, paying attention, but instead they're like got their phone under the desk. Who's in a who's in a meeting right now with your phone under the desk? Like watching the stream or with the phone face down on a conference table with an earbud in listening to it. Or you you're sitting at your desk working and you're listening to it in your ear. But you're writing an email to someone that says, uh, synergy. <laughs> oh, or yeah, a lot of, a lot of you work remote, right? So you're just sitting at home watching on one screen and you've got Slack up. Who's got Slack up right now? Raise your hand if you have Slack open at this very moment. How many, how many people here are software developers? If you're a, if you're a software developer, how many people, how many of you are in a stand-up meeting at this very moment? Just wink. If you're, if you are. <laughs> mm, you guys are going to get in trouble. I think it's nice to know that um, there are other people also avoiding work, right? Like nobody really wants to do it. And, and there are people who pretend like, oh, I love it. It's great. <laughs> Can't wait to go to work on Mondays. And maybe some of them are sincere, but I don't, I think there's a lot of guilt involved in like, being around those type of people and you're like, I really don't want to be here. Am I the only one? You're not the only one. <laughs> you're totally not the only one. Nobody wants to be there. Well, I heard her back from Nat. She might be getting something to eat. Uh, or she might be picking somebody to raid as we speak. Not a software dev. No meetings today. <clears throat> but you wrote, you wrote exclamation point software dev. So you kind of are a software dev. <laughs> you wrote a Boolean expression just then. You're starting as a software developer next month. That's cool. I mean, in terms of work, it's good work if you can get it. Like, it's way better than digging ditches for a living or, or uh, you know, working, washing dishes or, or uh, being a Walmart greeter or standing on a hot roof all day, you know, laying tar or, or, or a million other things. It's probably better than driving a truck, although I've never done those jobs, so I don't know, and I'm happy to be wrong about those things but software development is pretty cushy pretty easy way to make good money uh it's just also a lot of the work is uh bs just like every other job <laughs> self-employed forever wondering if i need mondays i mean one thing that is a brag about being self-employed is that i take a four-day weekend every weekend Sorry. Sorry. That's the last brag I'm going to do. Now I'm just happy to have a job. I mean, that's true. It is nice, right? Like there's a lot of having it like it's, and you know, being self-employed is like I said, it's not for everybody. It really is not. You should really think hard about it before you quit your job and try to be self-employed. In fact, try to be self-employed before you quit your job. You can do both at the same time. And you may find that you just don't like it. Uh, working for an employer is not really secure, but it has a different 
type of security than being self-employed. You know, there's like a, there's like a, a new layer of stress. It's different stress by being self-employed and you may not be, you may not like it. Was intent, not intended as a bool, just reflexively mimicking Twitch commands with the tag or title. <laughs> if your partner's next to me, he's a software dev. We have your stream on the TV and his meeting just got canceled. <laughs> he's like, woohoo. <laughs> yes, this guy gets it. He knows. <laughs> uh, time to hire you as an intern. Ooh. If only I could afford an intern. Just being beamed by billions of photons sent by a screen to make some magnetic stuff change from zero to one so that electrons in another place in space and time move in a consistent way to make other electrons move. Hopefully consistent or we have a bug. Yeah, there you go, Panda Coder. Two computers in front of you. One has Slack, one has me. <laughs> Get in line. I wish I could hire all you guys. This is why I need a, a publisher, right? I need to go to somebody and say, hey, I need, um, you know, two or three million dollars so I can make this particular game. And with two million dollars... I could hire 10 of you for two years and give you each a hundred grand to, to come work for me. And that'd be a fun two years. I think, um, I'm trying to make it happen. I'm doing my best. If I can get that deal, uh, I, I definitely will reach out to some of you, but don't hold your breath. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Because my experience with publishers is that they mostly say no. Especially right now, the economy is just kind of crap and everybody's holding on to their money and uh, it's just tight, you know, all around. <clears throat> you work for a lot less. <laughs> I mean, don't tell me that now. You just cut your salary right in half, Cam. Your fake uh, imaginary salary from Watson Games just got cut in half. <laughs> hey, Panda Coder, I see you're a mod. Are you? Have you been able to get a hold of Nat to see who we can raid out to? I, uh, I thought I would go till 10, but it's three and a half hours. And um, I've been up since five because I needed, I didn't anticipate this, but I needed to get up a little bit early to prepare for the stream. And then like a fool for my contracting job, which my grocery getting job, uh, I was up till 1 a.m. last night on a Sunday so this is one of the reasons why sometimes being self-employed can suck is I was up till 1 a.m. on Sunday, uh, got four hours of sleep, got up at five to prepare for the stream. And as fun as it's been, I am running out of steam. <laughs> so uh, we're going to we're going to cut the stream as soon as uh, Nat gets back in. And um, <laughs> he's lying. He's playing out by like. Well, okay, so this gives you an example of what my self, self-employed work is like. I was actually exchanging emails at 1 a.m., and while I was waiting for replies, I was playing Alpine Lake. This is what I mean. Like, this isn't a real job. This isn't like uh, digging ditches where you have to be, like, digging the ditch the whole time. I can play Alpine Lake while I'm waiting for an email and call that work. So I have no right to complain about anything, even though I was up at 1 a.m., This is, the world is crazy. Everything's silly. I 
I guess we can try and work on this a little bit more while we're, we got a little distracted. I got a little distracted. It's funny, like, a, like I said, I'm a game developer who streams, but honestly today it feels more like I'm a streamer who's like doing game development on the side. Uh, you guys have been a huge distraction, <laughs> just gigantic. And also I'm a little nervous, honestly, uh, hanging out with you guys because, you know, I want to make a good impression and I want to be a good ambassador for Godot. And it feels like there's a little bit of, you know, self-imposed like pressure and anxiety. And, um, I'm just not naturally an outgoing person, believe it or not. Um, Hey, Wallaber. Wow. And solar too. Everybody's a, everybody's a mod in here. I got to start adding mods to my stream. Uh, next time you guys come into my stream, so I stream on Twitch pretty regularly, and you should come follow me and, you know, smash that like button, bro. And when you come in, uh, I'll make I'll make you a mod. <laughs> I'm just going to assign mod duties to some people. I've got Irish John as a mod. Uh, he volunteered, but I never took it away from him. So he's just permanently a mod now. And he does still do the duties, but I need more. I need more workers. I need more free internships. And um, so come come over to my stream. You can be a mod there if you're not a mod here. If you are a mod here, maybe that you can be both. So let's, let's look at this uh, while we're waiting for Nat. Let's look at this A-star network. And like we noticed that the trucks, the tractors were going... Like they were following this path because it's like a two-way road, right? So they were going here, 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 here. And then they would do a weird turnaround and then go here, here, here. And I'd invented these as two-way roads originally because I thought, you know, I'll, I'll need two-way roads. But in practice, what I find is I make most of them one-way roads because two-way roads don't look as good. You know, they're just not as, um, like, interesting in terms of how the cars move. Because you don't want the tractors to just go bop, 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 bop. You want them to drive all around the port. You know, you want them to look busy. Like they're at a job. You want them to look busy. And so most of the roads need to be one-way roads. And it's the rare exception that they're two-way roads. Oh, Nat just said she's coming. So if we change that to a one-way road, now this track, and we'll change this one to a one-way road as well. So each of this has a connection. This node has a connection to that node, and this node has a connection back to that one. But we can delete that connection, and now it'll be a one-way road. And I don't know why my graphs aren't updating. They should be updating in real time. So now you can only go this way, this way, this way, and then you can only go out this way, and then you would have to go this way, this way, this way to get all back around. Let's try that and see if that looks better from just a vehicle driving perspective. I think it will. So now this guy will come over here. He's going to have to go around the a different way, right, to get in there. Oh, maybe not. He's going to go there, there. How could he go that way? See, now he's going around this way, around back, to get back around. But he's going this direction? That's unexpected. Oh, because I still have this as a two-way. So he's going here, here, here. This, I could connect this, disconnect that from 16. And then disconnect this from 19. So the tractor starts here, he'll go this way, and then he'll have to go around this way. Let's try that. There he goes. Going around the back. He's gonna come down this lane. Oh, why are you going that way, you weirdo? Let's make this also, this shouldn't connect to 26. Let 
Go around the back this time. There he goes. And then he'll go, yeah, like that. But then he'll go back this way and then around again. See, and that feels better. And then it's just a it's just a side effect of making the roads one way. So I'm I'm tempted to remove the idea of having directional roads, or I would change it so that the roads are one directional by default. Make two dimensional roads or two directional roads, two way roads. What's the word in human language for roads that go two directions at once? It's a two way road, right? I, I can make two way roads the exception and make one way roads the rule. And that would help me make the levels faster, basically. Bivectoral, yeah. Our bivectoral roads are functional. That's game dev speak. That's the that's the language of elite hackers. <laughs> hey, Godot engine officials back. Well, Nat, if you're watching, uh, I know this is a little bit earlier than anticipated, but I was just telling everybody I'm about to pass out. <laughs> from uh, starvation and lack of sleep. So if you can find somebody for us to raid, let's do it. And any of you who are Godot streamers, quick, go start your stream. <laughs> go start it right now. And maybe Nat will pick you. It helps if you... Oh, too late. We're raiding out to Digital Iliad. <laughs> With 106? 130? 144? Holy moly. Do we have a thing that we say, um, uh, Nat, when we raid in somewhere? Do we, does Godot have like an official squawk of some kind? Do we say doot, 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 godot? Do we do Godot, Godot, Godot? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. Do we, like, if we had some kind of uh, raid message, whatever you guys feel like. Yeah, there you go. What Temptic said. <laughs> no, let's not let's not bully anybody. We're not going to tell everybody to switch engines or whatever. I think Iliad is using Godot, by the way, though. So let's just go in there, hang out, say hey. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for the opportunity to do this. This is a lot of fun. Uh, a little stressful, but fun. Uh, thanks to Nat and Godot for being official hosts of this, obviously. Thanks for all of you guys for showing up. It was great. Um, I continue to stream over on my own channel, so if you want to continue the conversation or see what I'm doing over there with my games, please come join. And I'll see you guys again when I see you. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Enjoy your day. And uh, stick around, watch uh, Digital Iliad do his thing. Adios, everybody. Have a good one.